provide the opportunity to share your views. Thank you. This one as a, uh, I got it. Yeah, a little bit. No, I, I shot a oh. rubber band. <coughs> I was going to say, I didn't see it. I was, I'm Somebody. watching my. Oh, you put this down already? I did. Was I too, too nope. fast? <coughs> mm-hmm. So again, if you want to make a public comment uh, during the public hearing or during the comments section of Citizens, please fill out a no, blue card. You can hand it up to us up front, I and uh, we'll go through them <laughs> I thought I during did. that time. Yeah, I didn't hit it, apparently. <clears throat> I get interrupted. So now we have to wait. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, I know, because I, I thought he said. Thank you. That's something else. Oh. And so I turned What's my head person, away Judy? in the middle of, yeah, and I didn't click it. So Is it, Judy? it should come up any second. Yes, right. I'm going to yeah. introduce you. Like I usually do. Uh, <laughs> didn't look at the last name. <laughs> I, I can't give you that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you, sir. You know, like. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Should I try it again? Yeah. All right, I'll stop. Try <laughs> <laughs> starting. One of the better nights. <laughs> I will say that. Mm. Are we good, Diane? No. Just okay. We're having a little computer glitch. As soon as that's taken care of, we'll move forward. So far, I have about four cards. Again, if you'd like to talk, please fill out a blue card. Never gotten more. This is something I've gotten more. Are we all on the um, Unless I have hearing? to close out and come back in. Oh, wait. Now this says streaming here. But it's before it was start. Yeah, now it's but at least it doesn't opposite. Sound like Copy and paste. Yeah, yeah. All, yeah. The, all the emails we got on this? Yeah. <coughs> it wasn't the copy and paste. I have a couple questions. Uh, I'm not sure why it. Usually that comes first. Oh, okay. I'll stop. I'll close. Okay. Let's try it again. first, technically? Yeah. I've got a few STDs. So. No. You can't be a person. Well, that's interesting. That's okay. different. And, and so oh, then you forgot. No, we got drugs for that. I thought that was it. I didn't have that before. Oh, that's weird. I don't know where that's <coughs> coming from. Let's just see what happens. <laughs> yes. I don't yes. recall ever right. seeing right. that right. before. Gonna, you want to hold a committee. Now it's recording right. here. Yeah. You're gonna there you go. We should kick it. That's a good idea. That's the idea. close out the on base minute and open that up again. Oh wait, streaming. Okay. Now we got it. Okay. Now it's working. We're good to go? Um yes, we are good to go. Okay. I'd like to call to order the uh, City of Oconomowoc Council Common Council meeting for Tuesday, January eighteenth, two thousand and twenty two. Has appropriate meeting notification been made? Yes, Your Honor, it has. If we could all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. Uh, call roll, please. Alderman Mulder. Alderman Shellpepper. Here. Alderman Kavieski. Here. Alderman Douglas. Here. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Zappel? Here. Here. <laughs> Alderman Ellis? Here. Alderman Spiegelberg? All righty. Okay, we're going to move on to open a public hearing on the Olympia Fields plan development. Mr. Gallo, can you start us off, please? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, we have a public hearing on the agenda this evening. This is a request for the creation of a zoning uh, planned development 
overlay. The purpose is to give some flexibility for a project uh, called Olympia Fields uh, Development. The site consists of 46 acres in size. It's up on the screen right now. I hope all of your screens are on. Um, the developer's asking for six different uh, zoning exemptions. Uh, with that said, Matt Maroney is here. He's with uh, Wangard Partners. He is the applicant, uh, and he is going to walk through this. To avoid a lot of duplication, I'll have him explain it. I'll be available uh, during the meeting to answer any uh, zoning-related questions that you may have. After the explanation, we'll go through the uh, folks that have uh, targeted or, or, or want to go after this type of discussion. And when you come up to the um, podium, we're going to give you a maximum of three minutes. If you can try to come to your point, share your viewpoints about this development with all the council members, and then this will be debated and discussed later in the uh, council meeting among the council members. So it's a one-way discussion, and it's a way for you to give your um, input to the council members. Mr. Maroney. Uh, thank you. Matt Maroney with uh, President Wangard Partners. So uh, this evening, I am here before you to make uh, some requests for some flexibility uh, for this development uh, as we go forward. So one of the reasons why we're here is because we were successful in purchasing uh, the property that the, the city had uh, taken by uh, eminent domain. Uh, and so we're in the process of master planning uh, that property. Uh, in the, as, as we were going through this as well, uh, we had the privilege of working with uh, our anchor tenant, who I think all of you saw today will be Sendex. Uh, and we're talking to them about some of the flexibilities that, that they may need for their parcel uh, as we're working through this uh, as we go forward. So. Uh, so overall, here is kind of the revised site plan. Uh, so you'll notice that in the previous plans and all the renderings that you've had before, you've had, you know, kind of where the city land was, uh, just vacant land. Uh, that was not, you know, under our control, so we did no planning for it. So now you'll see, you know, a couple different uh, buildings there uh, to the northwest of the roundabout. Uh, you know, we would propose to have uh, a four- to five-story building, first-floor retail with maybe... Uh, a couple of them having a second story of retail and then apartments up above. Thank you for the pointer. Uh, you will also notice there's some buildings, uh, just kind of placeholders in the outlots uh, there along Highway 67, uh, you know, and, uh, and then also a larger building that kind of straddled our property and the property we purchased from the city that we moved the medical office building from over where the Kmart was uh, over to that location. So those would be the, uh, you know, kind of the major plan revisions uh, since uh, the purchase of the property. So we heard loud and clear throughout this, you want a walkable, bikeable, connected community. Uh, and so this highlights, you know, all the sidewalks, trails, paths to try to really encourage that to happen. And a lot of our requests tonight are actually trying in an effort to try to take advantage of those features uh, and try to enhance it and encourage that uh, even to a greater extent. So the first exemption that we're calling for uh, is a building height exemption. Uh, we think it'd be uh, important for this development uh, as you come in to have, you know, kind of a prominent feature uh, as we go forward. So the building's highlighted in purple. Uh, are the ones where we're seeking to have uh, some flexibility with the height. Right now, the principal structure uh, maximum foot for height is 50. We'd like to move that to 65 feet. Uh, we think this will allow us to have some flexibility to design some interesting buildings uh, with uh, some uh, rooftop feature on probably at least one of them. The second request that we're making uh, is... Uh, a setback request. We're asking to have a little bit of flexibility to reduce the setback requirements in certain areas. Uh, you can see in the light blue, we're asking to move the setback from 15 feet to five. Uh, in this area in particular, we want to try to take advantage of uh, you know, the traffic flow situation and use you know, these buildings to help slow traffic through the roundabout. Uh, to make it safer. We also want to create a feature 
uh, between the two buildings, an outdoor patio type thing that we think would be uh, you know, attractive as people enter into uh, the area. Uh, we're also requesting in purple uh, a side yard setback. Uh, originally that request we thought, um, um, well, it still is necessary for the sun decks because we're going to be dividing the building in half. Uh, and so we want to have the flexibility to, um, in that area, you know, um, divide the property the, the way that it's proposed right there. Uh, and then we have uh, a dual front yard setback uh, there along Highway uh, 67, uh, the area there in yellow. We want to move the buildings five feet closer, once again, to try to take advantage of the bike path that's existing there and to pull uh, you know, people into the development uh, in that area. So the next request is regarding uses. Uh, so we would like to, the buildings in purple, as we described, first floor, possibly a second floor of retail, uh, and then apartments above. Uh, we would estimate, you know, uh, about 80 apartments max, uh, you know, for, for that area. Uh, we'd have underground parking uh, in, that in those two buildings that would be connected to underground parking. Uh, they would go in through the north uh, and then exit out the west uh, in that area. And uh, right now, um, you know, we want the flexibility to um, allow residential use, a mixed use uh, for that uh, particular parcel. Uh, the next one is parking. Uh, from a parking standpoint, we have large parking fields out there. Uh, we're taking a look at the, the, the uses, uh, and uh, we would like to reduce uh, the parking from one parking space per 250, foot, 250 square feet to one for every 350 square feet, uh, you know, just to create more um, flexibility. Uh, you know, create, you can see some street trees, create a, create a different kind of look out there uh, to be able to do that. We have worked very closely with our anchor tenant to make sure that they're comfortable with this parking approach. Um, and uh, I believe they, I've shared a letter with the city uh, that they are supportive of this request as well. So in this area, once again, it's just some relief from parking. We have multiple uses that have different standards uh, for parking in this area, um, you know, and we believe that we're going to have ample park parking in this area uh, for the different uses at the different times that, that are needed. Um, and so we would like a little bit of relief here um, that uh, we're, we're allowed to kind of load the parking lot, you know, based on those two uses and the, the timing of those uses. Uh, and then the last... I think this is the last one. Uh, as far as request, this is side yard setbacks. Um, so we want in certain areas to reduce the side yard setbacks to uh, zero. Actually, there's one more after this, uh, to zero. Uh, reason being, especially in the area outlined in yellow, uh, you know, along Highway 67, uh, north and east of the roundabout, in that area right there, uh, we would like to try to encourage sharing of parking lots. Um, I think uh, as well, possible sharing of driveways, just to create some flexibility uh, there for different types of users to, to share uh, and, and those sorts of uh, needs for their particular businesses. And I, and I think, you know, I should also note that we're not proposing to uh, um, change the open space requirements at all. I think with this, we can actually uh, do a better job on open space uh, with this kind of flexibility as, as we move forward. So, um, so that would be the request. And you'll see you know, kind of the two other areas, once again, between the anchor tenant, Sundex, and the other buildings, we need that kind of flexibility. And then uh, between you know, the, the proposed apartments and the proposed medical office buildings. Uh, and then this one is our last request. Um, so this would be our terrace areas, paved, paved areas set back from the terraces. So you can see that we're, we're requesting uh, reduce it from five uh, to zero, five feet to zero uh, in these areas. This is something, again, that we're looking to do to give us flexibility. It wouldn't occur in all of these locations, 
Uh, but for particular uses that want to try to attract people off of the walking paths or the bike trails into, you know, um, those establishments, uh, we think that kind of flexibility will add to the vibrancy of the development. So that is the reason for that request. So that, in brief summary, is what we are proposing to do. Thank you. I'd like to open the public hearing. Uh, Judy Taylor. Can you please come up to the uh, podium? Please state your name, your address, and what community you live in, please. Good evening. My name is Judy Taylor. I live in the town of Oconomowoc. Um, and thank you for allowing me to be here tonight, Mayor and Common Council. I'm the Executive Director for the Waukesha County uh, um, Center for Growth. We are the economic development arm for Waukesha County, and I've seen you all before. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight to, to support um, Olympia Fields in this project. We know that this um, particular project is not only going to be great for this community, but certainly will be great for our region. As we talk about re regional economic development, we know this will draw a lot of people not only from the city limits, but all throughout the county as well as cross county um, in the region. So I'll continue to support the project in any way I can and work with Matt and Stu and the Wangard team as well as Bob Duffy and others to not only drive opportunities this way to attract different tenants and others to be able to make this as best of a community and vibrant uh, place that it can be. Um, so you know, please know that I have that effort in mind and we'll do everything we can um, as a county and an economic development arm to support those efforts. So thank you so much for your time and really appreciate the energy you're putting in to make this a great, a great place. Um, in the Waukesha County. So, thank you. Thank you. Ralph Redlin. Good evening. My name is Ralph Redlin. I live in Heartland. My wife and I uh, own a timeshare condo in Oconomowoc, and I am, in fact, the treasurer of the Vacation Owners Association. Uh, which board of directors has met at length and discussed this project myriad times over the last year. Our board of directors is made up of people from Colorado, Chicago, excuse the reference, uh, <laughs> uh, as far away as North Carolina, Florida, people from all over the United States are interested in what's going on in our area because the timeshare has struggled to retain members. However, in the last year, we have seen a significant uptick in interest in our membership and an uptick in interest in acquiring units in our development, principally because of Olympia Fields. And reports that Yvonne McGavick, who is our executive director, and I, who live closest, have been giving. I've been in uh, occasional meetings with Matt Maroney, and I will say that uh, having been a practicing public accountant with a specialty in uh, construction industry, there are a few people who communicate as quickly and as well with me. Even the clients didn't communicate as quickly and as well often as Matt has. In particular, we are thrilled at the development of the baseball area. I shared that with Judy earlier but we are exceptionally thrilled with the way Olympia Fields is moving ahead. Uh, there are a few things that Matt has talked about. The walk paths are especially interesting to our visitors from around the United States to Oconomowoc. They want to be able to hike to get to these shopping areas and these other supporting enterprises. Uh, the, setback, the setback requirements that he's asking about, uh, he and I have never talked about, but on reflection of that, it looks to me like if we go walking along there, it might be wise to have a fairly proximate ability to get into the businesses that are right along there. All in all, I would say that this is a huge positive development for our project, for its future, for the people that visit this project, and for the city of Oconomowoc. That's our opinion as a couple invested, and my opinion uh, representing the board of directors 
of the Vacation Owners Association, Inc. of Olympia. Thank you again for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I do not have any further blue cards for the public hearing a topic on Olympia Fields. I have one that we'll bring forth um, during the comments section from citizens on another topic. Do we have any further comments uh, from the public on this topic? Anyone else would like to share anything for the public hearing? Do you want us, as a point of order, Mayor, do you want us to ask questions for, of Matt then later when we vote yes. on it? Is that okay? Yes. yes. Or, or of Jason? Yeah, later. Any further comments? Okay, at this point, the uh, public hearing is now closed. Uh, thank you very much. We'll move on to our next item, approval of minutes. So for January Zaffel. 4th, 2022. <laughs> Did you catch that, Diane? Yes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, on to comments and suggestions from citizens. I have one comment card. Um, Julie <coughs> Na Naku, Nanku, I'm not sure if I'm reading it properly. Can you please state your name and uh, where you live? Yes, my name is Julie. I'm on 537 Greenland. And I came uh, earlier tonight to hear the conversation regarding the library. And I just wanted to show up as a resident and uh, speak to my support of the library and that they think they're an exceptional resource to our community and that they've done a great job of making sure that they're fulfilling their mission statement and really creating an environment and a community mm -hmm. that enriches all. And um, so I just wanted to come out here tonight to say that, that it's really important that we do have members in our community um, that the books that were discussed tonight are highly important to and definitely enrich the lives um, of individuals specifically in this community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other comments from citizens? We'll then move on to um, our next item, Olympia Fields update. Mr. Maroney is going to, as planned, going to give us an update as to where we are currently and where this is going. Um, thank you, sir. Something wrong with the hit what? Go to the next one. All right, it'll probably work. All right, I th uh, thank you again. Uh, Matt Maroney uh, with Wangar Partners. As promised, uh, we indicated we'd come in with regular updates. We thought this was an appropriate time to come in and provide an update. So my friends at the Vacation Owners provided me this, uh, this uh, editorial that was in the Waukesha Freeman, which I thought, or cartoon, editorial cartoon, that I thought was appropriate, right? Hey, this won't be easy, but I think we can revive them. Well, they didn't revive them, and this isn't easy. Uh, you know, we're still dealing with a lot of legacy issues that I'll talk about as we go through here. Uh, but with the partnership of the city, we're, we're making great progress. Uh, we're really excited about, uh, you know, the annou today's announcement. Uh, and we have more to come in the weeks ahead. So we're, we're rolling. So a quick recap of demolition. It started on 426. Took us a little longer uh, till September 30th till we were completed. A lot of that is because we found a lot of environmental surprises, uh, you know, uh, and we handled with those surprises working hand in hand with the DNR. Uh, you know, when we ha found a surprise, my first phone call was to the DNR and like, how do you want us to handle this, right? Uh, we want to be good uh, corporate citizens uh, and uh, and do what's right, but we found uh, an area where we had a parking lot on top of buried asbestos walls, on top of a parking lot with an uh, underground storage tank to the side. So uh, a lot of good, fun stuff uh, as we we're going forward. As a result, our costs were up significantly, higher than what we'd even uh, put in for a contingency. Uh, but that's our responsibility. That's our uh, uh, risk for the project. Uh, and then 27% of the demolition cost was related to abatement, which was significantly higher. They didn't have to disclose to you that there was a storage tank? <laughs> so, well, I think there's lots of things out there that weren't disclosed, Matt. So, uh, uh, so one of the goals with, uh, with this project is to track apprenticeship hours 
uh, and Waukesha County companies and safe working environments. You guys were insistent, Alderman Zappel particularly, uh, on having those in the developer's agreement. So those are in there. Uh, so we track those. So blew way past the apprenticeship hours. And a lot of that had to do uh, with environmental apprentices doing the environmental uh, abatement. Uh, we used four Waukesha County-based companies in the demolition, uh, you know, with the lead uh, company being New Berlin Grading, right, um, with the owner right here in Oconomowoc. Uh, no, our, our, our biggest thing that we're pleased about, no injuries, no accidents. This was not a safe building to take down the way it was built. Uh, and uh, so we had involved a lot of structural engineers to help guide us along the way. Uh, and thankfully, uh, very successful from that standpoint. Uh, we try to salvage as much as we can, recycle as much as we can, and then you all can still see the huge crushed uh, concrete uh, that we will reuse. Uh, so here is uh, the apartment real quick. So right away, we started working on site work and grading. Uh, everything's on track. We will have our first apartment building open by June 1st. Uh, with the clubhouse will be open at the same time, uh, June 1st. Uh, and then every six weeks thereafter, we'll have another building uh, come online with completion date of February 2023. Despite all the material shortages uh, that we're facing, we're finding alternatives, we're still on time. Uh, just a site plan. Um, you know, we added uh, the one building, what I call in the, in the little area, uh, where the theater was that was part of the parcel that we bought from the city. So that's part yeah, right there, part of that building uh, was formerly on city land. We closed on that little parcel in October just to keep the construction rolling. Uh, just a rendering, nothing's really changed. You've seen this in the past. Uh, our interiors, kind of, that's kind of what what it'll kind of look like on the interior. Uh, here's just some current photos on construction. These are a little old, probably two weeks, three weeks old. And people have asked about the retaining wall, and maybe I should clarify that real quick. Uh, so the resort was actually built uh, kind of into, you know, that area. It was multi-level, and people, I don't think, really realized that. And so there's about a 15-foot 15 different, 15 different grade from the uh, very south end of this parcel to where the pond is, and so this retaining wall is necessary to provide structural security for, or, or integrity for the buildings that are going on past it. So this is a more updated picture. You can see the clubhouse is, is getting well under its way, um, you know, as well as the first apartment units. So contru construction costs about $40 million, 50% of our subcontractors our Waukesha County uh, contractors thus far. Uh, we're tracking apprenticeship hours. I don't have an update on that. Uh, we're using the Craftsman Design Standards, which I know is also important to the council. Uh, and uh, once again, no accidents, no injuries so far. We have on-site safety instructions uh, prior to the start. Uh, and the really positive thing is we've had a lot of inquiries already about people leasing. So that that's, shows us that there really is a good market here. Uh, just more statistics here for you. Uh, nothing has changed. This is the project, the unit counts, types of units, because we've been getting more questions about that. So I thought it'd be good to put a slide in there so people have that information. And I think uh, Mr. Duffy's going to make this available, uh, you know, after, so people can pull it down on the city website and get the information. Uh, so this is the partnership, right? We've been working on infrastructure together in the tax increment uh, district. Uh, we, the city is investing about 11.2 million to install supporting infrastructure. Uh, phase one has been well underway. Uh, and then uh, we are, or Stu, not we, Stu is uh, guaranteeing that we will hit our investment goals. Uh, and uh, we're real confident with the way things are going, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, be very successful. So phase one infrastructure is complete, except sidewalks uh, and Kari's courts. We worked with the city. You know, at the time of the year, we just kind of thought, hey, it's best not to pave right now or right towards the end of the, se the year. Plus, it allows us the opportunity to get more heavy equipment back there, uh, you know, and not, uh, you know, do any damage to the, the roads. So that will go, the, those will be finished up in the spring. And then phase two infrastructure is going to be very important to us. 
so coordination is going to be key. We're impacting some of the businesses out there. So we're having with a joint session with the city uh, to talk about phasing of construction, the plans with the business community. They've been invited this Thursday uh, to walk through those issues uh, and get their feedback and make sure everybody's, you know, um, knows what's going on. Uh, I think the plan we put together is good. I don't think anybody's going to see, you know, major disruptions. Um, you know, access will be retained, uh, but uh, it'll be a little different and signage and communication is going to be absolutely important. The big uh, thing is it's absolutely important we get this completed uh, on time with the roundabout. Our anchor tenant needs to be in with functioning roads uh, November 1st. They want to be operational. Um, so um, I think everybody on the city staff and our staff are working together to make sure uh, we hit that uh, uh, timeline. The most expensive part of the city work is this next phase, phase two. Uh, so we've been monitoring uh, what's happening there. And we've, we've had a little surprise. There's some additional work offsite that's being required by the Wisconsin DOT uh, on Highway 67. Uh, and so kind of you can see those areas, they're kind of shaded with red outlines, um, you know, along Highway 67. Uh, that's where we need to add either turning lanes, um, adjust the roadway slightly. Um, so that's the area where uh, additional work will have to be done along Highway 67. So you heard me talk about it before, walkable, bikeable, connected. We've heard, heard you loud and clear. We've got a good trail system um, you know, put in place. We're really uh, happy about that as well. And we'll be working on the public art, uh, the landscaping features, all that. You'll see that coming back um, here relatively soon as well for your uh, review. So um, you're aware we purchased it. I think the other important thing is there was concern about one of our neighboring uh, property owners right there on Paps Road and Highway 67 and about maybe we might need some additional land from them. Um, we were able to work with the DOT and uh, city staff and design you know, the road coming in from 67, Paps Road, uh, in a manner that we were not required to take any property from that property owner. So. Uh, mission accomplished. We weren't sure we were going to be able to do it. I couldn't promise we would be able to do it. I said we'd make our best efforts, and we were able to do it. So I'm happy to report that as well. Um, and then we are working, you know, to remove, there's easements all over this property um, with different um, owners of the easements and beneficiaries of the easements. Uh, and we've had a lot of luck getting many of them uh, removed voluntarily. Um, we're still working on trying to get the last couple ones over the finish line. And then here, which is important to all of us, is the guaranteed minimum values, um, you know, and I'm confident, you know, we're well ahead of schedule of where we had thought we would be, so. Um, here's kind of a tentative timeline. So uh, January announced the major anchor, which is Sundex. We just did that today. Uh, you know, start work on the city infrastructure as early as March. Uh, you know, they're going to start as soon as they get their approvals, uh, which I believe will be coming forward, you know, probably in March by the time they go through the planning commission and staff review and all that. The major anchor will start construction um, shortly thereafter. Uh, and then, like I said, October 15th, we'd like to be done with the infrastructure uh, to give us time to uh, um, allow a, um, a little bit of cushion. Um, and then um, K, the occupancy of the Kmart building by Sundex by November 1st. Um, we already talked about this in the public hearing, so I'll skip that. Uh, so here's the proposed elevations. Uh, so this would be the eastern elevation for Sundex, uh, and then the proposed southern elevation for Sundex as well. You can see uh, quality looking building. Here's a, a rendering. Um, showing what, uh, you know, kind of a, a view uh, looking to the northwest. Uh, here's a view looking to the southwest. So we're, I can't tell you how excited we are about uh, having Sundex. Uh, this will be one of their larger facilities. It'll be 60,000 square foot. 
uh, that uh, um, that will be located here. So, um, and uh, I will say just based off today's announcements, we've had a lot of inquiries from other people that want to locate in the development. So uh, in the next few weeks, we anticipate we'll have further announcements and we'll start working through the approval process for several other things. So uh, we're um, as happy as can be, uh, very bullish uh, that uh, with our partnership with the city, we're gonna be able to, put, to accomplish something pretty special here. Uh, so, um, but we've gotta do the trails, art, wayfinding, pond improvements, uh, and other wow factors that are important to the mayor and the rest of you. So that work will be done this year, but we have to get that kind of officially planned and ready to rock and roll. Uh, there you can see the picture of our team at Wangard. So everybody's really dedicated to this project. We're gonna make it happen. Uh, we anticipate a 7,200 square foot clinical building located on Highway 67 will be coming forward very shortly for you uh, to review. Uh, we anticipate a, a financial institution on Highway 67 too coming forward very soon. A national restaurant chain on Highway 67, probably coming soon. Uh, and then there's others, right, that we're working through uh, as we go forward. So that's my brief update presentation. Want to try, kind of keep it quick, uh, but uh, really want to thank uh, a lot of people that have worked hard on this. So, uh, so the city administrator, uh, your economic development director, your attorney, um, your finance staff. I mean, there's been a lot of teamwork to pull this off, and we could not, from one guard's perspective, have better partners than the city of Oconomowoc. So thank you. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Do anybody have any quick comments, or we'll move on to the next agenda item? Alderman Zaffel. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Matt, thank you for the presentation and for the update. I uh, really appreciate you uh, coming to give the presentation today in regards to um, how things are going there. Um, I'm wowed by the apprenticeship hours. That's amazing. It's fantastic. Uh, this past weekend, I was down um, at Pfizer Forum, and I was uh, grabbing a beverage over at Good City Brewing, and I saw a guy with a New Berlin excavating coat on. Um, he said, I'm out there doing the work. He said, here's my son. He's an apprentice. He's about to buy uh, his first car, he was saying, so it's pretty exciting to hear that. Um, and 50% of contractors from Waukesha County, that's amazing. We didn't even ask for any residency component of that. that that's awesome. Those are dollars coming back to our community. They're being re reinvested in our community. So that's amazing. So I, I just want to give you kudos for that. So. Thank you Thank so you. much. We look forward for the next update. Right. Thank you. Um, we're moving on. Uh, to consent agenda items to set the uh, trick-and-treat um, hours for Saturday, October 29th, 2022. I'd entertain a motion. So move, Kavieski. Second, Zaffel. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, next up on our um, topic, our committee reports. We're going to start off first with consider act on staffing changes for the police department. Chief Fister. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, tonight, uh, before you, are the staffing changes uh, with the City of Comac Dispatch Center going over to WCC. Uh, we're looking for uh, position changes, the five uh, dispatch, full-time dispatch positions and the six part-time dispatch positions will be eliminated upon that transfer. And I can uh, tell you that everything's going uh, very well with that transfer at this time. Uh, so what we are looking at, I will start with the, uh, the first uh, change that we're looking for is the police administrative assistant job. The only thing change on this uh, job is the job description, uh, what they're going to be doing inside the police department and uh, on there. The second one is the evidence and property custodian. That position was part-time clerk, part-time evidence custodian. Uh, we are not adding any new positions to the police department. Uh, these positions are existing. We're just changing what they're doing within the police department. Uh, and at this time, we see uh, a great need to increase uh, evidence and property, and uh, that needs to be a full-time position uh, within the police department. And then the last position is the police support specialist position. I'm asking for five full-time positions and three part-time positions. 
Uh, those will be keep us 24-7, 365 uh, throughout the year, and uh, we'll be able to snap this for the community and keep our community safe and our officers safe. I'll entertain any questions. Alderman Zathel. Uh, thank you, Chief, for the update here. Um, in regards to the 24-7 uh, operation, um, you mentioned in the committee uh, this evening that uh, for a com community our size, you would recommend that we have 24-7. Uh, what are the surrounding communities uh, doing um, in regards to this for their communities, similar sure. size? Um, it's hard. We're a unique community, and, and we're kind of that middle that middle ground. But uh, the other communities uh, that did go over to WCC, such as a Brookfield, um, Menominee Falls, and so forth, do still continue to have a 24/7 um, access and workers there that can respond to answer phone calls uh, and other things that go on throughout the 24-hour period. Thank you. That was going to be a follow-up question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Alderman Rozak. Thanks, Chief. Um, Delafield and Summit have um, sally ports and holding rooms, but they don't have 24-7 coverage, do they? No, I know they don't have 24-7 coverage, correct. But, you know, and they're a little bit smaller than us. Menominee Falls, New Berlin does. They're mm -hmm. about twice as big as us, give or take. Sure. Um, so we're kind of in that middle ground. I, I understand some of the difficulties there. Um, but I do have a couple questions about how you presented this because I'm I guess I'm confused when we had when we had full-time dispatch We had five full-time dispatch. No, we had five full-time dispatchers and four part-time, right? Uh, five full-time and six part-time part -time. is what we okay. current what we had, okay? Um, and we also at that at that point we also had two Administrative assistants, right? We have one administrative assistant and one part-time clerk slash part-time evidence custodian. Okay, and you said that at the at the um, at the committee meeting, which I didn't know. So the this person that's the evidence property custodian is going full-time evidence property custodian, essentially. Correct. They're full-time now. We're just going to change it to full-time evidence. Gotcha. So what you're really asking for is an additional one person, essentially, one full-time position, right? No. Okay. Because I, I had five dispatchers, okay. I'm asking for five full-time specialists, okay. and we'll still have our administrative assistant. So you're not, a, it's not five new ones plus the first one, the one, there's just five? No, correct, okay. just okay. five. Because the study gave you, the study we voted on a while back said, and we adopted the findings of it, was four full-time staff and 1,500 part-time equivalent. Um, so when we talk about the three part-time positions here, what's our FTE on that? 1,500 hours, 1,800 hours, 900 um, per person? Well, we we stay over twelve under twelve hundred per person. Okay, under twelve. So there is, there will be some increase, but my understanding too is that, um, the committee meeting, that you're still under budget, based on this year's budget, which was adopted last year's budget, which was adopted with full time dispatch still. Correct. Um, do you anticipate budgetary issues next year with the staffing? I don't. I mean, we're, we're looking at a lot of different things. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, but I don't expect anything. Um, you know, some of the other areas that were talked about in the study, uh, you know, we're working on some of those contracts that were out there to, you know, uh, filter some of those away and, and get uh, better results on that. Good. So, you know, I, I don't anticipate anything. Um, one other question I had. Um, in the evidence and property custodian section of your report, you you said that was mostly for body. Well, you think you need more because of the expansion of the body camera thing, right? Yeah, mostly yes. I mean, um, our clerk spends a lot of time in there right now. Um, we've seen a significant increase in the past two years of open records requests, and that's standard throughout law enforcement right now. Um, and with the body cameras and the squad videos and everything else, uh, we're going to get a lot of lot more of that. And we have to do a lot of redacting on that as well. Um, so I definitely see that as a full-time position within the department. If, so if your evidence custodian position, though, um, in general, I mean, if there, let's say this doesn't come, you know, we get the body cameras, everything's in, you know, mm -hmm. whenever. Um, 
and they don't get the, the amount of requests we think. Are we going to still use that person in other clerk functions or data conversion or whatever else we need? I mean, we'll evaluate it. I mean, it might be something we can move down to a 30 hour a week, you know, or something like that. If they're not, if we're not needed uh, that much, we can evaluate that and we can come back to the council in, you know, six months and say, here, this is where we are. We can lower this to uh, 30 hours, you know, a week. So I, I think I'm going to vote in favor of this. I, I do want to obviously keep a safe community. I appreciate your presentation. Um, I, there are two. The, there's two concerns I have, um, and I do. I think this should be evaluated before October, our next budget cycle. Is one, um, the the reason for the evidence property custodian increasing to full time was the body camera stuff. So I, I think it'd be helpful for us to know, August September, has that really come to fruition once everything is installed? You know, we usually got 15 open records requests a month. We're still getting just 15. You know, it hasn't gone through the roof, and this person could be dropped down to 30 hours or 25. Um, I think that's important for us to see. Absolutely. The other thing I know, I know we went over and we discussed 24/7 at night call center, and I, I know there's issues with that, but I and I don't think it has to be addressed at all tonight. But I, I do, I would like a, a, a fair evaluation from your department, utilities, whoever. Is that something that really we need? Because we're in that, I, I agree with you, we're in that sweet spot. We're not Delafield, we're, we're bigger than Delafield, we got more going on, we're, we're bigger size-wise. But we're not New Berlin, and Menominee Falls that border Milwaukee County, has a lot of spillover from Germantown and Milwaukee and West Dallas and stuff. So I'd like a fair, uh, at some point, a really good evaluation of what those third part, you know, those third shift clerks sure. are really doing. And how many utility calls are they taking? Is right. it five, you know, 15 a night or is it one? You know, yeah, we're going we're gonna to definitely track all that. Uh, we weren't tracking that, but new, we will start tracking all of that. Um, and I guarantee we'll come, if we don't have the stuff for a third, third shift person, we'll come back here and, and I'll tell you that. Well, so. and then, yeah, but you know, I, I, the reason I'm going to probably vote in favor of this tonight is because I have my number one concern is someone there to monitor the video Correct. cameras when there's people. Which is mine me. as well. And, and I know that, and I don't want to take that away from you guys. Um, I, my understanding is if you bring in a person to book, you, there's typically two officers with that person anyway, right? Correct. So you have two officers in there. I understand the concerns of, though, if somebody becomes unruly or there's more than one in there, it can be an issue. So I don't want to take that away from you, but I do, I, I really encourage you and, and utilities to evaluate, you know, what we can do to change maybe some of this if we get there. Um, I think that's part of why we did the dispatch changeover as well, although not the primary reason. Um, we have... We have the ability to maybe make some changes, um, also technologically. You know, we do the parking stuff where we, people still call in for parking. We need to go to an app-based parking program. They have them all around the country um, where they pay a small fee, they get their overnight parking permit on their phone, and it goes into our system and our guys see it or get, get a printout, you know, that morning or whatever. Um, and, and call centers too. I think we can do some, ish, some things to address the utility calls at night. Um, I know that's not instantaneous, and you got a lot on your plate because you're doing the conversion. I get it. So um, I appreciate it. I know sure. I had a lot of questions. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Mulder. So I should have brought this up in committee, and I apologize for that, but um, Alderman Shell Pepper brought up some good points that we were talking about. So when the original, the original report we had when we switched over, from the consultant was about 180 hours a week is what they anticipated needing to do 24 seven, and that is what they recommended. Now with 168 hours in a week, if I'm doing the math right, that seems pretty light to me to mm -hmm. only have that little bit because you need backup for lunches and shift switch and stuff like that. What you're proposing takes us to more like 250 mm -hmm. a week. Um, so that's a thir that's 33% more than, than what was recommended. Um, I don't know if that number is right or wrong. I don't have anything to reference that, but that seems like a big increase from where they were. Do you, are, are we? And we had a discussion with uh, uh, the study uh, about that. Um, and when you start adding in vacation time, sick time, comp time that they earn, FMLA, uh, and all these other things that are out there, and we actually start we plotted this all out on numerous schedules. You know, we looked at different scheduling, changing hours, doing everything to try and make the four work. Um, the five, it, it comes out almost almost perfect with five. Once we look at all of that and we compared that, you know, to uh, what we had in the past as well. So the other difficult part is they're putting a number on part-time there. 
those hours might not be the most favorable hours that are going to be available. Uh, so you also have to look at that as well, is how do we get somebody, you know, there certainly could be people out there that want to work 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., you know, in our center, you know, and so forth. Um, but it, it's a difficult process. So I assure you that, you know, we looked at it. Um, and, and talking to Matrix as well, um, they said, yeah, it was probably a little light, you know, uh, on their side, you know, for that. Because when I said, well, we got X amount of hours and that means we need so much. Um, so I, I think we're there. I don't think uh, right now we're going to be overstaffed. Uh, but if we are, I have no problem coming back here and, and yeah. telling you that. So okay. Thanks. Sure. Alderman uh, Kowieski. Um, one of the things we talked about in committee too was, and we've talked about over the last several years, in regards to what uh, kind of calls come in with utility. Um, and I've had some conversations with, with Joe in regards to call center alternatives to that. Um, to our internal staff handling those calls. We were, we had asked what the cost uh, contribution was that utility was making into that level of service of $700, period. Yeah, about $720 mm -hmm. per year. A, year. a year. A year? Yes. A year. So what, <laughs> so what I would like to recommend is that, um, you know, the, the quality of service that we can provide internally as opposed to externally, um, I think is probably superior. Uh, but there's a cost to that. Sure. And I believe Utilities was prepared to, to look at seven or $800 a month for that coverage. We're paying $720 a year um, for that service from the utility, which is light. And if we can, um, back charge utilities or charge utilities for that service for the amount of $800 a month. Now that $720 turns into $9,600 sure. that can go into that labor cost. Um, and it doesn't impact uh, the rate payer. It doesn't impact um, the taxpayer. And I think that would be an appropriate way to, to help contribute to the cost of service. Sure, and I think that's a great idea that you brought up, and we can move forward on that, and I can work with Mark Fry and Joe and uh, Lori on that as well. Yeah, I was going to say we'll want to evaluate it and come back with a cost-based number and more than likely discuss it at budget time. Yeah, I, if we since there, there hasn't been a baseline of what the amount of calls that come in over the next year, if that's being tracked, that becomes a baseline, and if they $800 a month uh, charge to utilities for maintaining that level of service, comes that baseline and those spike, now we have a, an opportunity to charge accordingly for that service. Sure. Alderman Shell Pepper. Thanks, Chief. Sure. Appreciate you being proactive in general on this topic, you know, post-dispatch discussion. You've been doing well at moving forward, and um, I appreciate you coming to us now in a proactive manner to discuss the concerns you have up front. I'm kind of like a visual learner, so it's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around what we're trying to nail down here in terms of like where we're having the gaps. So, so the recommendation from the study, and I know um, Alderman Mulder just kind of went over this, was four full-time police clerks and 1,560 hours of part-time police clerk activity. I know at that time you had told me you had concerns with that number. So I, you know, I, I don't believe this is like a necessarily a surprise but I'm trying to understand where the gaps exist um, by you know, using those part-time numbers, um, hours, and for full-time police clerks. You know, where, sure, where is, sure, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I'm trying to, I, it's hard for me to. And, and I know I, I gave a, a, a couple of spreadsheets and I know they were tiny. Yeah, it was very hard. <laughs> for, I couldn't make so sense. So I do apologize for that uh, and so forth. But if you look at the two different scenarios there where it has four and five, um, when we have five dispatchers working, what basically happens is every pay period we have uh, a minimum of eight hours that will need to be covered by part-time employees. That's without using any off time, vacation time, sick time, any of that other stuff. Okay. So that just even with five employees, the way a schedule works, there's going to be a minimum of eight hours in a pay in period. a pay period. Okay. Okay. If we transition that to a four person, um, 
I go up to, you know, some pay periods are 68 hours. Some pay periods are 112 hours. Um, and I can tell you that that may take six or seven part-time people because part-time people are part-time people. Mm -hmm. And the way the hours fall, they may pick up an eight-hour shift here, uh, and then there's another vacant eight-hour shift later. The next person picks that up. But then you go to the next day, and there's another eight-hour shift open. And then the next day, there's another eight-hour shift open. They only want to work maybe two days out of the week, eight hours each. So all of a sudden, I start having hours that nobody wants to pick up, you know, uh, because of that factor. So, so that's where it kind of comes in. I don't know if that, that explains it better. That, no, that does actually make a lot of sense to me. And, and then I even kind of put in, like, some of the macro factors happening right, right now with the pandemic and just, like, right. how part-time jobs are already. So, Correct. you know, I mean, every industry is hurting. So then to think we could be putting ourselves in that position is, you know, uh, if we agree on the premise that 24-7 is the right call, and that's kind of what we were working Correct. off of the study. That's what you've recommended in, in terms of that. So, um, so then the other question is... <laughs> it's a net, you're saying it's net neutral in terms of new employees. Is that what you're saying? Or are we bringing on additional full-timers and, and part-timers? No, the support? number is, uh, the number's five, okay, that we currently have in dispatch. Yes. Clerical is five. Mm -hmm. The two other positions on here already exist. So we're adding zero okay. positions. So then looking forward, I know... Um, because we adopted the, the recommendations of the survey, of the findings, um, how does that look going forward for our, our budget then in terms of, I mean, is this going to be an extra expense that we weren't necessarily tabulating as part of this, you know, overall adoption of the study? I guess that's what I'm, I'm trying to, you know, figure out. Is, is, this our, is this a higher spend then overall? Were we not anticipating this? It's hard to say. There, there's a lot of factors that are going to come into that. Yeah. You know, um, they calculated four and part time. Um, you know, we're at five. It's going to depend on do all my full timers take full benefits? You know, do they not take full benefits? Um, how about our part timers? You know, I mean, the hours are there. You know, I mean, we're good. We have to pay somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's just a point of. So I, I don't necessarily think there's going to be any issues there. Yeah, I, I get what you're coming at, mm -hmm. um, but it's hard for me to say. I didn't get that detailed with Matrix about how they broke down every position, you know, and how they went through all of that. Um, but we had general discussions with them on this, and after talking to them, they agreed. Um, you know, like I said, that their position was a little light uh, in there, um, and they could see a five, a fifth full timer. So, okay. Alderman Douglas, all right. Chief, I have quite a few questions for you. Okay. Well, um, one, currently, your, the way you do your reports, do you dictate or do you uh, have the officers type them? Currently, the officers are typing, but we are exploring the dictation uh, to get the officers on the road a lot more. So if you go to dictating, it's imperative to have 24-7 coverage. So the clerk can essentially type the report to get to the DA, DA's office by 10 a.m. Correct. For charging. So that's one thing. Um, Two, how, what's the shift minimum of Town of Oconwalk on third shift? Uh, one. One, I believe. Okay. So uh, our current staffing is two for minimums? Our current staffing is two? Yeah. Correct. Um, so being in booking, you have two officers back there, and there's sometimes you have more than one person back in booking with you um, that's under arrest. <laughs> so hypothetically... You know, we were talking about officer safety that came up um, with the dispatch study. You know, being on the same frequency with fire, it's an officer safety issue, it's a public safety issue. Um, so now Summit has two on night shift and the town of Conomac has one. But there's something else going on that they're responding to in the city because their two officers are busy and Correct. booking. Um, you're essentially mutilating the county that could be as close <laughs> as Delafield. Um, Hopefully. Right. Um, so at that point, if you have two officers that need actual help back there, um, you know, you're potentially putting out a 20-minute, 15-minute response to get someone there, um, and then how do they get a gain access to the building? Correct. Um, so I'm in full support of 24-7. Uh, I think there's efficiencies that could be done with other things, um, but I think you do need to have 24-7 coverage. And coming from where I am, um, you know, we have 
six full-time dispatchers. So it's 24-hour coverage. Um, they do a lot of our clerical stuff as well. So you're actually asking for one less than where I am that's significantly smaller than here. Um, we don't run any part-time staff. Um, so that's one difference. But um, I think the big thing, talking about everything in the past of body cams and it's public safety, it's officer safety, um, you know, the officer safety aspect's huge of having someone there that can let someone in. And one of the biggest things, personally, me, that, you know, voted for dispatch to go over to WCC, it wasn't a savings issue. It was a public safety, officer safety issue. Um, so that's why I'm in full support of giving you, you know, what you asked for. Alderman Rozak. Just one real final point. Um, I agree with what, what Chris said. Um, <clears throat> I think when we did the dispatch changeover, one of the things at least I said during the comments and what I promised was to make sure that we continued the same level of service here in Oconomowoc. And um, if the chief right now thinks that same level of service means we, you know, we do this versus what the study says, and I think the study might have been a little unclear because they already had two, like a part-time and a half, two full-time. Right. So the, that number, the four and their part-time numbers might be a little odd. Um, and the only reason this is a debate, I think, is just when you when you look at the numbers in general, which is why the questions, especially um, Mulder brought this up too, 24-7 coverage is, is 8,760 hours a year. Five full-time people, 1,800 hours, if they're working 40 hours a week, is 9,000. You add in the part-timers, that's 3,600, so that's 12,600 hours of staffing. But that doesn't factor in the vacation, the time off. The, they, they came in, but then they got sick and they have to leave, and now you got someone else that's got to get called in. So... I, I don't think it's it's outlandish at this point, um, and we said we were going to keep the same level of service. So I think we have to we have to stick with that. So thanks, Chief. Thank, thank you, Alderman Kavieski. I'd like to make a motion to approve, as presented. Second, Zaffel. Any further discussion? Call roll, please. Alderman Mulder. Aye. <clears throat> Excuse me. Alderman Chelpepper. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Douglas. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Zappel. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Under utilities, consider Act on Resolution 22-R3004, awarding <coughs> contract for a 20-year electric distribution plan, including a five-year construction work plan. Lucas. Thank you. Uh, so I'm here tonight looking for approval for our engineering consultant for the electric system study. Uh, the electric utility solic solicited an RFP for a 20-year electric distribution uh, distribution plan, including a five-year construction work plan. We sent it to six different firms that received it. We got three responses. Uh, this study will help us guide us into the future for the next 20 years, in essence, to help uh, master plan our electric system. We followed the city's procurement policy. Uh, for the qualified base selection and graded all three of the applicants that we received. EPS engineering design was the number one with a number of 67,800 and we're requesting a 10% contingency for anything that may come up during the study uh, for $6,780 <clears throat> for a total of 74,580. This is under the estimated budget that we had of 105,000. So looking for a motion to approve that. Do we have any any questions or comments? I'd like to entertain a motion, please. So move Zaffel. Second, Ellis. Any further discussion? Call roll, please. Alderman Mulder. Aye. Alderman Shellpepper. Who stepped away? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Um, Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Douglas. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Zaffel. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. On to our next item, consider act on resolution 22-R3005, awarding contract for design modifications and construction administrative services for well number eight pumping station. Scott. Yeah, thank you. Uh, tonight you, we have the memo and the resolution in front of you uh, to have the same engineering firm do the design and construction administration for our well eight pump station. Uh, we are currently in the middle of drilling the monitoring wells and test well. Uh, we also have a uh, firm under contract to do the design of the pump station. Um, and we've learned due to the complexity of this utility project, large scale, lots of complex, uh, specialized coordination between design and construction administration, we are asking uh, to use the same 
uh, firms to do both of those. Uh, this is no financial impact. We budgeted uh, uh, for this. Um, so I, I, we're looking for a recommendation to uh, approve resolution R3005. I'd like to entertain a motion. Rosek, so moved. moved. Second, Ellis. Any further discussion? Call roll, please. Alderman Mulder. Aye. Alderman Shellpepper. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Douglas. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Zappel. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. On to plan commission items, consider act on extraterritorial preliminary plot for the Snyder Farm subdivision located at West 359 North 6280 Brown Street in the town of Oconomowoc. Mr. Gallo. The application for this preliminary plat came before the plan commission. They recommended approval. It's for 77 lots on the southeast corner of Highway P and Snyder Lane. The lots will be about three quarters of an acre in size each. They are not taking any city water or city sewer. It's all served by the city, but it does fall within our platting area, so we have <laughs> the rights to review it. Recommend approval of the plat. Any questions for Mr. Gallo? Mr. Rozak. I guess I've never asked this question for eight years. What if we didn't approve it? What, what would happen if we just decided not to approve the extraterritorial extra zoning? Right, there are certain town? reasons you why you could. If you take any action, it will be deemed approved. What if we deny it, though? What if we vote it You down? have to have a very good reason yeah. to, not, to deny it, or will you be sued and you will lose? What would we be sued for? You, you could. Uh, because you're taking um, action on the basis of your extraterritorial uh, land division uh, authority I, 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 without right. any reason. Well, what if we just, what if we think there's too much, I don't know, building going on on That's that side enough. of town? Okay, so what would be a reason that we could deny an extraterritorial zoning? I mean, why, why even have the approval process if we can't deny it? You can, if it is in your um, comprehensive plan that lays out standards. It's, this one's not. This well, is not included. It's nowhere near you, so right. well, it, it's not going to affect you. I no, I know it doesn't. Um, I've just been. I know that the state's trying. I know there's some efforts to change the law on the extraterritorial zoning because it doesn't make any sense. But well, this is land division. Not right, this zoning. is extraterritorial platting. This oh, platting, is strictly yeah. the review of the land divisions. Um, someday, this land could potentially be in the the city. Doesn't. Seem likely, but the whole town could collapse, and and it could be come, it could become city. So if if there's certain things, if they're creating lots that are circular in shape or or unbuildable, and they are all wetlands, and we we just said this is not really good planning, we could deny it okay. for those so reasons. Your recommendation in an instance like this is this looks fine. It know. looks fine. All the lots or, are rectangular. Or a safety issue, something like that, that create a safety issue for the city. Something okay. like that. Read um, Madison versus Boucher. I'll do that on my way home tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to, uh, Alderman Kavieski. You know, I, I, I get there's some uh, lighthearted humor associated with the question uh, as it appears. But I think it's a valid question. If, if, if there's not a purpose for an approval, why have the approval? So good question, yeah. good answers. I, I'm all in favor of it, but it, that, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Nothing wrong with it. You're welcome. <laughs> I'd like to entertain a motion, please. So moved, Ellis. Second, Zaffel. Any further discussion? Call roll, please. Alderman Mulder. Aye. Alderman Shellpepper. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Douglas. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Zaffel. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Um, on to our next item, consider act on ordinance 21-01024, creating a pl uh, planned development overlay district, PD421, for Olympia Fields commercial development, including lands at 1520 <coughs> Unity Drive, 1408-1414 Summit Avenue, and 135-1375 uh, Royal Mile Road. Please uh, recognize that this is an ordinance change and request, and it's your first reading, and you have the option to keep it that way or waive that if a motion is made. Uh, Mr. Gallo. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Right, we have an ordinance that's on the agenda. The staff prepared a draft. The plan commission had some concerns. Uh, those changes have been incorporated into the ordinance. Also, updated plans were submitted based on plan commission's request to provide certain exhibits um, of what changes and where. Like, for example, there was six exemptions being requested. One of them was building height. The plan commission asked, where is the building height? Is it all 20 buildings or is it just one building or two? Well, they said it was three buildings and they colored those purple. So those plans were uh, updated uh, since the plan commission meeting. Uh, packets were, were sent out to you and the ordinance was updated referencing these updated plans. So um, if any changes are made, I can certainly incorporate those, but I just want you to know what you'd be acting on is the plans that you received in your, your packet, as well as the recommendation of the, of the plan commission. Now we held a, a public hearing earlier this evening on this, this creation of the plan development overlay. Uh, the only people that spoke were, were the, the applicants and other people in favor of, of these changes. No one spoke um, against this. There is, again, it consists of 46 acres in size. It's all um, mostly non-residential areas. One of the exemptions is, is to create two buildings to allow some mixed use, which is a new trend in these areas, uh, to allow retail on the ground floor and residential above. Um, you know, with the development of this size of 46.3 acres, Typically, a developer does need some exemptions. Um, you know, there's a lot of parcels within the site, and uh, a lot of we'd like to encourage cross access easements. So this is not um, unusual. You know, Paps Farms has a PD overlay over the whole thing. So this this is fairly typical. Um, I think the biggest concern that we had of is is probably the one exemption about building height out there. It's a 50 foot maximum, and uh, they're asking to go up to to um, 65 feet. Now, I did some studying. I, I have the Town Place Suites with their building height. Um, I have the Fowler Lake Village example and the Hackney House apartments with their heights. And, you know, like Fowler Lake Village really depends where you're measuring. You know, they, they go up to um, uh, 62 feet 8 inches, so 62, um, but the top of the pergola would be 69, and then there's an elevator shaft that comes up, and that's uh, almost 78 feet tall. So it really depends where, where you're measuring, but the, the top of the main building is, is like 62 feet. Um, uh, the Hackney House Apartments is, um, the, I took the, the biggest one, the three-story one, it measured out at 39 feet, but it was built up on a hill, the ones closest to the road, the site drains to the north, so, you know, there's probably five to seven feet of grade there, um, so it's, it's probably closer to around 40 feet. The Town Place Suites Hotel, um, again, it's kind of got an unusual roof line, the main roof is like... Um, about 45 feet, but then there's these projections of another seven feet going up, so about 52 feet. So if you really want to know what 50 feet looks like, it's probably the, the, the latest uh, town place uh, suites uh, hotel by Marriott there is 50 feet. Um, the other exemptions they're asking for this evening, the setbacks, um, the, the, the parking uh, reductions. Uh, I, I, as, a, as a city zoning administrator, I can get behind all those. I'm comfortable with, with all of those. Uh, the plan commission will be reviewing each site individually as a building gets constructed. We'll look at the use and we'll look at the exact parking counts at that time. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions and I know the applicants are here as well um, about this PD overlay. Alderman Kavieski. Um, I, have, I have several questions, most of which will be uh, for Ms. Maroney. Um, I appreciate the fact that um, Ms. Maroney spent time with Alderman in, in, individually and, um, and groups too to review and provide um, some in-depth <coughs> information before tonight's meeting. Uh, during that, we had some discussion about a couple of things that I, I wanted to, to bring up. Um, and there's, there was obvi obviously uh, with public knowledge, there were some uh, public comments that were shared um, both directly and indirectly through social media in regards to some concern. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, a, I think, uh, an appropriate 
uh, venue to, to address those so that the public knows that they're being heard and what the what the answer is mm -hmm. and then whatever that opinion is to the answer is what it is. So um, there were some, I've heard concerns about uh, bait and switch and um, a, a desire to maintain that small town feel um, that Oconomowoc is really known for um, as it applies to the additional height. And I, I think you covered some of that uh, initially. Initially, the, the main location off the roundabout um, wasn't yours. Correct. There was nothing that you presented to the community nor the council that you're coming back to change. This is part of a revised plan um, that incorporates that property and the utilization of that property to maximize the development and the benefit of the community. Um, is that fair to say? Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I, you know, we didn't we didn't want to make a presumption at all through this whole project that we would get and attain the city uh, parcel. Uh, so we didn't plan for it. Uh, you know, that's why in all the exhibits, it's always been vacant land because uh, we don't want to be presumptuous. Um, we're happy we got it because we think it fits into the vision that we heard early on from the city council is they wanted something uh, that was live, vibrant. Uh, you know, we heard the Drexel Town Square was a, a, an example that people said, you know, that's something, you know, early on when we were doing the project. Well, there really wasn't a, a, a parcel to really create that type of feel because um, that really needs to be kind of in your focal area and your entrance area. So, so, um, so no bait and switch because it was never on our plans. This is, this is just something, you know, new that's coming before you. The other um, thing that I, I heard was, man, if the council allows that additional height here, they're gonna, they're gonna be requested to provide additional height everywhere, and it's a slippery slope. Um, and I think the request for the additional height where you've requested it um, has specific uh, purpose. Yeah, it's, it's a specific purpose. Once again, trying to create that energy, kind of that vibrant stream, kind of that feel. I think the other thing I would say is, you know, the you know, we would not go very high on the outlots. Um, you know, people need to have a view corridor back to the businesses, like to the, you know, the, the Sundex store, you know. So we're very strategic about where we're asking for these, the height request. And there's scale associated with that, as you mentioned. So you're, you're starting out relatively low uh, along Summit. You're potentially stepping up to 65 feet um, along that main artery toward the, the pond. And the scale associated with that to the hill is the hill's about 135 feet ish. Ish, give or take I think it's two, two. one. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, is it more? 160. Yep. So it's it's significantly higher. It's not going to be a blocking of that that hill. And that hill is really, I think, a critical element of the next phase of development as it's moving west. Um, that's really where the excitement comes right. from. Right. And these are conceptual plans. I think it's important to, for people to realize, too. We've, we've got to, you know, go ahead and do the planning, uh, you know, but it's nice to know kind of what the rules of the game are so we know what, what uh, level of creativity we can have to create, you know, kind of a first-class <coughs> development. A um, couple other things. I'll, I'll share the floor as we kind of do the loop. So. Okay. Any other comments? Alderman Rozak. Hey Matt, thanks for coming. Um, You're welcome. I, I'm okay with uh, like Jason is with the the uh, some of the height issues, the side yard internal setbacks. The one I had a question about, maybe because I can't conceptualize it, is this um, uh, terrace setback. Yeah. I mean, does that mean you're going to put those buildings on 67 right on that walking path, basically? No, that, that we bike path? I don't. Well, won't be the building. So you know, you got the terrace area, which which is kind of a green space area that will buffer you know, the, the lots and anything right. on inside to the bike path. So we want the flexibility. We're not saying all the buildings would, would do that, but have the flexibility to kind of create kind of, you know, let's just say it's an ice cream store, right, that wants to locate in that area. It'd be good to have, you know, an easier to get to pathway and a little outdoor seating area off the bike trail. You know, there's probably some concerns about safety and all that. We, so we'd have to work through the design process as well to make sure, you know, it's not just one th through thoroughfare, right. you know, um, so, to do that. So, so just walk me through. 
along the bike path there, which is really cool. Um, it's a good connectivity to the other like country trail and everything yeah. in the whole area. Somebody could potentially put a building with like an ice cream stand, according to this, right on <laughs> the path, right, right next to the path. Well, the building setback requirements, I want to say, is 10 feet that we're requesting in that area. And then we're having a, you know. I thought it was zero. And I no, that's the, ter that's the terrace area that is zero. The <laughs> building, there's still a building setback that okay. would be 10, 10 feet off. So what is their terrace? What does that mean? I guess I'm just, maybe I'm struggling with that patio. terminology. Patio. 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 Okay. Could go right on top of it, right next to the bike path. So right. it should be directly connected to it. Okay. Alderman hey, Mulder. Were you done, Matt? No, I, I did have another question too. Go ahead. The, but that's okay. Um, I, I'm okay with the, the, the heights requested here. Um, the, the two pink, the three pink buildings in exhibit, um, whatever this is, six here um, in our packet. Um, I think it looks odd to have height on those three buildings up to 65 and not have that other building at the equal height. If that's going to be a medical office building and you're going to have all that height, I think that should at least be 65 as well. And, and maybe we should talk about whether 65 is appropriate or something closer to 70 for what Father Lake Village is. So they can do a terrace or a patio or whatever. So, Alderman Mulder? So that actually was my question. 65 feet, is that the top of whatever's up there, if there's a pergola up there, or is that the, the roof line and anything on top of that? Is it's the top. Above? So the uh, nothing taller than 65 Nothing feet. Tall, taller than 65. Because that, yeah. And that, we talked about this, is that, so that you anticipate that being four levels of apartments? Yeah, one story of retail generally. There might be an exception that goes up to the second floor, but right. then, then, uh, than four stories of apartments. What does it do to the economics if that's, if it more than 50 but less than 65 and you get three layers of apartments, is that not what you want? Is it make it an untenable project? It, it'll make it, it'll, it'll, it'll move it into the questionable line, I think. We haven't run the full numbers on it, uh, but with, you know, with a project like this, right, you need to, you know, uh, make sure you have space that's affordable for people to rent, not only on the retail, but on the apartment side. And so if you should restrict it, you're driving up your rents and, you know. And I think it's good for the city too, it's more increment. Right. Alderman you told us we don't have to worry about that. You've pretty much. Well, 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 well. We all, we're always gonna worry about it, right? 12 year payback, I, I, right I'm up at night, still years, worrying. Am I gonna meet my increment payback. requirements? Yeah. So, cause <laughs> Stu's gotta pay the guarantee. It's not me and I'll be in trouble. We have a lot of <laughs> questions for you, so I'll try to get to everybody in the when I see him, Alderman Ellis is first. Okay, a, a side yard of uh, zero setback and a terrace of zero setback. <clears throat> I have concern on that for mm -hmm. safety purposes. Mm -hmm. um, you have the bike trail right there. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody veers off, somebody is trying to miss a branch, whatever the case may be, can land in another person's property. We got, all the, we got other issues there. Sure. Is it really that necessary for you to have that? That's a great question, Alderman. It's not. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I think it would make a more attractive development. I think it'll invite more people into it. But if that's something you guys aren't comfortable with, that is not a game changer for us. So okay. uh, we, the, having the flexibility to have that as a design element, we would like, but it's not necessary. Thank you. Yep. Alderman Shellpepper. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been a supporter of this project for the most part, but, but with caveats. I'm not a blank chip check supporter. So yep. I, I support when I'm provided with the evidence to make me decide I should support it because it's in the best interest of our community and the people who live here. Um, I think, you know, the beginning of this, when, when the city was looking at um, forced taking of land, I wasn't in favor of that until I was provided with physical evidence that showed we had exhausted all possible revenue, you know, avenues to, to get to that point. That was shown. We made the decision. We came together as a council and unanimously, unanimously, unanimously voted in favor of it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's where I kind of go to this this piece here on the height. How come you can't give us some renderings or some drawings or something <laughs> that just shows us what we're working with here before I sign off on it on behalf of the people it's, in this community? It's it's a it's a legitimate great question, right? And so this this um, the. The story here is things have gotten accelerated with our anchor tenant. 
you know, and so originally we probably we needed a whole bunch of other variances as well that was pushing this uh, and forcing us to kind of design the whole project uh, very quickly. And, and they want some certainty too, and other tenants do as well of what's occurring. So everything is going, which is good, a lot faster than what we had anticipated going because uh, we really weren't planning on getting in really in the designing phase uh, until probably this spring, this summer. But we're having a lot of questions and people want to know what's going to happen here. And so in order to provide that kind of certainty, we've had a rush, uh, you know, to kind of plan this out. And with that, um, I think the other positive element is the anchor tenant Sendix is using the architect that we recommend for our entire development. And so they're busy trying to get that up and running at the same time. So it really is, you know, kind of about man hours, why I can't get you a rendering, hey, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, you know, I probably can in two months, but in the short term I can't, but I've got other parties interested in investing in this area that want to know generally what's the game plan. Well, I want certainty too, though, too. And so sure. the people yeah, that, no, I... you know, that live here and that I represent, they want to know what they're getting as well. And so that's why I'm like, well, how about we sign off on, you know, all these other exemptions you want? Mm -hmm. minus the height requirement until you come back and bring us some some drawings, some renderings, so we can actually get an idea of what we're working with. Can you do that? Uh, we would like to have the flexibility to know what's going to happen. And, and, and Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, architecturally and all that kind of stuff. I don't know if it comes back to the council. No, nothing's uh, coming back here just, after so, we sign off on this. So. And I'm not looking at just from an architecture standpoint. I'm looking at it from, I mean, what is it going to look like with the hill in the backdrop, what is it gonna look like in general? It's a big decision for the community. The, there's no other buildings like that, you know, out there in, in that area. So it, it does, and you know, we're talking about precedent. And I liked Alderman Kavieski bringing up a lot of those points. They seem to come from my Facebook page mostly <laughs> that people were making. So, cause I'm asking for, for feedback from, from the community and asking what people have concerns about. Right. Um, and so those are some of the things that we saw. Um, and so I, I think it is a big decision, and, you know, and it kind of fits into this broader discussion of where do we see heights being like you know, out in this Summit Avenue corridor going forward? And I know we don't legally obligate ourselves to have you know, future 65-foot buildings wherever they want. I, I understand that, but it certainly sets a, a precedent for council consideration that, hey, we've signed off on this once before, and we're gonna, you know, we might do it again going forward. And so I just want to make sure we have all the information up front that we're fully aware and transparent uh, you know, as to what's happening. And, and it's like what you're saying is like, well, I want that transparency for my, you know, for my, um, for my buyers or potential tenants. And I'm like, well, I want the transparency for, for my community and, and the people I represent. So that's what I'm trying to, how do we come together on that? Yeah, and I, and I think in all fairness, you know, the direction that we were provided very early on was don't piecemeal this, come in with a master plan, don't, don't piecemeal it. So we heard that very loud and clear the very first time we started this project that that was not going to work, right? So I need, I need certain variances to make certain things happen. And I, I'm just taking the advice from the pre, what I got direction from the previous council. And then in those discussions as well, we heard very loud and clear, we want something vibrant. We want something uh, similar to Drexel Town Square. Well, that's what we're trying to deliver, you know, by creating some, some height variance. So that's why we're here you know, to have this debate, to have this discussion. Is it appropriate, is it not? We think it is, uh, you know, appropriate. Uh, we, we think it sits with the vision we heard early on uh, from the council uh, when we started this project. And so that's what we're planning on trying to follow through on. Alderman Kavieski. Are you done? I'll, you go Come ahead and okay. we can wrap back around. Okay, um, thank you. A uh, couple of things, the, 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 the safety associated with the zero setback to the to the, I'll call the patio area. Mm -hmm. I, I think that element um, is is going to be important to create that vibrancy, <laughs> and I do understand the safety concerns associated with that. And we had talked about maybe incorporating ballards um, along there. I think if we can structure this approval with the safety element incorporation to allow for that zero setback however that would need to be done, that would provide the public safety element associated with the vibrancy associated with that visually as you're going down Summit Avenue. So I, I, if we can do that and if 
we can make that happen if you so choose to yep. allow for that. I think that would be beneficial. Um, in regards to the height and, and the concern associated with, with that in general, we saw that play out in the downtown here. Uh, it started out with the Worthington and it created um, a, a move to create a, an, an overlay for the downtown that had vision corners and step backs and things of that nature. Um, perhaps that variance from 50 <coughs> to 65, 70 feet incorporates step backs. Mm -hmm. um, if that could be incorporated into the approval that provides for the height and maybe a little bit extra height to accommodate for the value proposition associated with that, um, that interest architecturally um, plays to everybody's best interest and doesn't set a precedence that 65 feet of straight, straight, yep. narrow um, is acceptable, nor in the community's desire uh, for how it's represented moving forward. Yeah, we heard that loud and clear from the Planning Commission and from many, many of you, so uh, we understand that. So, I, you know, if there were step backs, I'd actually be okay with 70 feet because that allows for um, the, the square footage to be developed without creating the, the alleyway uh, effect. And I agree with um, Alderman Rosick that if, if you do it on the, if we do it, approve on the uh, two buildings uh, off the roundabout and on the one close to the pond, it would make sense to give the ability to do that in that in that center building, just so you don't have some kind of a, a wonky looking visual. Um, I think in the discussion we covered the, the points of concern associated with scale, mm -hmm. um, and scale I think is appropriate discussion in regards to that that main road that would go back to the hotel. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we go on to some step backs with that, with the hotel, that provides some unique opportunity for that hotel on those upper floors um, <coughs> with the additional height that could have some really nice benefit to those who are um, coming into our community as an event driven destination mm -hmm. with the amenities that hopefully play out in that phase two, mm -hmm. um, and for everything that the downtown currently brings. So I don't know how you would want to structure the motion tonight to incorporate those because you do want to see something approved and I would support um, you know, waiving that first reading if we get it right tonight, if the council feels we're right tonight, we might as well just make that happen. So there's, a couple other things, but we'll yeah, I need to go on. Alderman Zaffo. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Matt, uh, again, for coming to present to us mm -hmm. tonight and uh, excited about uh, the anchor tenant of Sundex. Getting a lot of excitement from my, my neighbors. My wife texts me. She's like, hey, ran into, you know, Selena. She's excited. Ran into so-and-so walking the dog and um, very excited about that. But thank you uh, again. Um, I, I'm going to echo Alderman Rosak's comments from earlier. I think uh, for the medical building, you might want to look at the height there. Um, Oconomowoc's an evolving uh, community and opportunities to attract more complimentary businesses to support our amazing downtown here in the Lake Country area. You know, we just need to remain flexible, I think, uh, from the council level. Um, at this point, I haven't heard anything from my neighbors, uh, constituents talking to them uh, when I've been out and about uh, to not be supportive of what's presented here tonight. So thank you. Alderman Shellpepper. Well, I, I think, you know, all those things could be true, Alderman Zappel, um, but I, I just don't think we've gotten that much feedback on the height in general yet. I don't think there's been that much opportunity for the community to weigh in yet on this. I think it's been a few weeks. Um, I definitely wouldn't support waiving the first or the second reading. I think we should bring it back again to let the community continue to know what's going to happen here. And I guess I'm just not going to support any height exemption without having renderings and drawings. So I'm happy to vote in favor of all the other exemptions tonight, but I, I, I'm not signing off on, on the height without knowing what I'm signing up for. So that's where I'm coming at it. And it's not, it's not saying it's, it's a not happening. It's just asking for the information to make sure we're doing our due diligence on the front end for the people we're you know, supposed to be looking out for. So that's, that's where I'm coming down on it. Hmm. Alderman Ellis. 
I concur with um, uh, Alderman Sh Shel Shelpepper. I think that uh, because 15 feet is, is pretty substantial, I really would like to have a visual just to, uh, so that I can understand what your concept is. Um, <clears throat> I still think that the setback of zero is very concerning. Um, and you've already said it's not a deal changer. Um, and I'm, I, I, I think that for safety purposes, that we, we need to just take that out. That's Alderman a Douglas. Policy statement. Yep. All right. So it sounds like the biggest thing here is the height. Um, it's one of the biggest things that people are talking about. Um, people are talking about 50. You're requesting 65. 70 was brought up. Um, what height do you actually need? I'll be blunt. What height do you actually want? 65. Your original renderings and stuff, you don't need anything more than that? Our, our what makes our, you go to 65 rather than 80? 80 would be, 80, eight, well, eight, 80 would not, I mean, that would push the, that would not work with visual corridors, what we want to try to accomplish. That, that's, that's too much. But at 65, you said the project was questionable, whether it's going to be profitable and everything. So, <laughs> it's, we're, once again, how do I put this? We've been asked all along to come in and don't piecemeal the plan, right? So that's what we're trying to do. We're at this point in time, and we're saying, here's a concept, here's what we want to do. Uh, we've not run the numbers on it yet. We've not, you know, had the chance to do any any of that kind of detailed type of study that we do to do the project. Um, so that can be done, but that's, we're piecemealing the project. Um, and if that's a change of direction by the council, it's a change of direction by the council, we understand. But that was not the understanding that we've had from the very beginning of this project, because I think it was Alderman Rosek that basically said, I don't want to have you guys piecemeal this project, yeah. you know, coming back. I don't know, if, or was it, it was Alderman, I can't remember which one. You guys, I think we're both on the same page. I just want you to meet your increment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, and I, I do exceed, too. Exceed, exceed. So, <laughs> um, so, so that's, that's why we're here, is because we don't want to piecemeal it. Um, you know, and it's a policy decision for you guys. I, I, we, you know, we would hope we've built up enough trust to show that we deliver on what we say and do a great job, um, you know, and, you know, if, if you want to make a different policy decision, that's, that's why you guys get, get paid the big bucks. Alderman Kavieski. So, so going back to 2019, early 2020. 2020, yeah. Um, it was, there was discussion about the resort and doing something with the resort and then doing something over here and doing something over there and trying to piece something together. And at that time it was voiced and I think concurred it by the council at the time that that was not in the best interest of the community nor the development and that a master plan comprehensively needed to be developed in order to move forward, which led us down the road to support the public infrastructure in a master plan um, approach, which I believe is going to work out in the best interest of the community and the development um, and creating a destination oriented development along the Summit Avenue corridor. Those are all very important, I think, not only to the community, but to whatever developer um, heard that, is you, um, to deliver. Mm. The, the height request um, to me makes sense. One of the things um, that we've, that I've heard being on council, and Matt, you've heard it a little bit longer than me, because uh, you've been on council longer than me, in regards to Paps Farms development is nobody knows where retail's going, nobody knows what anything is gonna happen, so we're just gonna have to create piecemeal. Right, so um, having the concept of that Drexel Square, that integrated retail residential component seems to be kind of a hard line trend, and that's not going anywhere, and that's why you're, you're coming in for the height request. Mm -hmm. You have potential tenants that are interested in more than single story, potentially two story, which then drive up the height to that mixed use um, approach. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it's fair to say. So 
again, I would uh, support the 65 feet. That's all you need. But I'd like to see a step back element associated with that. Um, I think that that plays to the architectural planning and development in the downtown district from what we learned from that project that I mentioned initially. So there's some consistency from our downtown district to the Olympia Fields area to Pabst Farms. That makes sense to me. And again, I understand Alderman Ellis's concern associated with the safety element there, but I think if we can incorporate the ballards with the safety element, so you don't have a bike or a potential car or whatever that may be in a, in a bad scenario that has um, complete access to whatever pedestrians or patron, uh, patrons are enjoying the ice cream on the patio, that makes sense to me. Are you referring to a fence? No. Um, not Help me understand. So a, a ballard um, would be... Um, like what we have in front of the police station. Yeah. Like in front of the police station. Those are ballards. Okay. Concrete structures. So they can be decorative elements, but they're safety elements as well. So it, it prohibits um, that vehicle or whatever from... Uh, taking out an entire row of patio seating along that um, bike path. I just don't see the natural The greenage. natural beauty to the that? The beauty, that? yeah, I just don't so, see it. So I would su suggest, you could tell me if I'm completely wrong, it ha that would have to come to architectural committee. Correct. There is a craftsman style element associated Correct. with that. They're not going to um, approve a blaze orange ballard Along Correct. there, it's going to have to blend into the architectural design. Thank you. There's there's two issues. I'm, I'm going to try to just speed up this a little bit. Talk about uh, building height and then the the patio area. Okay, uh, building height. I think what they're asking for is on the the two main buildings there. They're looking for retail on the ground floor and then four stories. If the retail is 15 feet, and then each uh, floor above that, the four is 12, that's 48, so that puts them at 63 feet. Will that be apartments? Yeah, the four four ah. would be apartments. Okay, okay. So they would like, that, that gets you to 63. <clears throat> yeah. Then on top okay. of that, they would like to have some type of a, a rooftop right. feature, like a clubhouse or something up on top, a rooftop element that would get you, you know, up, okay. that's why they're, yeah. they're talking, um, they're already at 63, they're asking for that, they're, you know, uh, Mr. Maroney said 65 would work, but the, if you want to give them some rooftop Element. excitement, they could go up to maybe 75 or something. Now, the step backs, what our downtown has is it allows these buildings uh, pretty tall, but it says you go up 30 feet, then you got to go in 10, and then you got to go up, if you, you can go up another, once you hit 50, you got to go in another five. So we could mirror something like that to to allow um, not that, that straight up wall, that sheer edge going straight up. So the downtown, we've already, the precedent's been set downtown where you um, have a 10 foot step back at 30 feet and then another five foot at 50 feet. Jason, so, where were you 30 minutes ago? That's. Where, yeah. where were you 30 minutes ago? All you had to say was that there was gonna be retail on the bottom and, and the next whatever park. was gonna be apartments. Right. Guess what? We would have gone on from there. Yeah. So I think we, I, I don't know, I can move on now. I'm good. That, that one building that they're not asking for the height on, I, um, we can't require them to go a certain height, but maybe you could say a minimum. I, I, what did I write down? Um, um, uh, middle buildings should, should be you know, up to 65 feet, but it's hard, maybe a minimum height uh, require like maybe 40, 40 feet or something. Yeah. That's what we did in the downtown area. Um, and then the, I know there's concerns about the, the patio areas being a zero setback. You know, remember our downtown is zero setbacks all over the place. So it's, I'm not concerned from a zoning. I think that would give it some vibrancy right off the path. I don't think there's no buildings zero setback. It's, it's the parking lot, maybe a trellis would be there, outdoor picnic tables with, with umbrellas, that type of thing. One thing I'd like to just add to council, when this came to Plan Commission, uh, after it went through the Plan Commission, 
I had them go back to double check the infrastructure because I didn't want to have us end up in the same situation with the wrong infrastructure that we have across the street. So they've given, staff has given me confidence because these two buildings are larger buildings that what we're doing will not have a negative impact on infrastructure and development to the west because of a couple different ways things are constructed. Um, so we're in a good position there so we don't end up in the same situation, for example, with sewer capacity and stuff like that. I've come back to uh, Alderman Mulder, who, who is next. Um, so Jason just contradicted a little bit what I'd asked before, was that 65 is the maximum, and that would be the top of the pergola or top of whatever you have out there. That's not what you just said. You said 63 feet would be the top of the building, and then you could put restaurant space or event space on top of that, which visually there would be something above 65 feet. Is that? It, it, so our request is 65. So I, I, we put forward a request, and I'm going to honor what our request is. So, so we would work with whatever we have up to 65 feet. So this is a, and this is, I should know this, I suppose, after two years on council. Um, we're, we're, at, we're talking about putting a lot of things in here, like the step backs as part of the ordinance. Is, is that the only chance we have to, should that be written in here? Is that the right place to be putting that level of detail in? Yes. Or is that something yes. that, so it's down to that last detail. Okay, sorry, thank you. Alderman Rozek. Okay, so here's what I'm hearing. Um, I, I had original concerns about the patios and the terrace area. Just as a question, I didn't uh, functionally understand it. We have zero setbacks in most of downtown, Beer Garden. I mean, you go to really vibrant areas like San Antonio, they literally have the patios like right where people are walking, you know, right on the river walk, and that makes it vibrant. So if I, I don't, I, I'm, a, I'm a little afraid that like only two or three of these places will have a patio on the, on the, on the thing and it's gonna look a little funky or wonky, but we gotta put a little trust in them to do this right and make it look good, and I think they're gonna want to. Um, that bike path there could be really cool if there was a bunch of restaurants and stuff there with patios right by the bike trail. And you can pull off, park your bike, and go in and get, so it'll go in and get a beer or whatever. Um, and of course, still making sure that you only have one so you're <coughs> driving safely, Chief, <laughs> on, on your bike. Um, so I, I'm okay with that as long as, you know, architectural is going to look at that. As far as the building height, what I'm hearing is 63 is kind of like, like they're like pressed in. To me, we need to give them some, some room to make this work. They've got additional uh, financial pressure on this project because of the DOT. So the DOT is forcing them to redo three of those roads. I don't understand why that happened. I, I, I wish more of that would have been cleared up, but that's just a fact. Um, so we, we, what I think we should do is the two apartment buildings in the corner that are pink, I think we should give them up to 75 with step backs at the fifth, fourth and fifth level. I think it fifth. would be the fourth and fifth level. Fifth level, right? Fifth level and then the, the very top level can't, it would be a pergola or, or something like that. It can't be like another build out, essentially. So you get, Is, okay. You get a one level of commercial for residential and then, and that last residential's gotta be stepped back. So it's got, because the, the number one hated building in town is Worthington, and Worthington is disliked because it's right on the thing, and it's straight up and down, and there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those two buildings should be there. I think the middle building should go up to 65 as a max, but it should have a minimum of 50, because otherwise I think it'll look wonky. If you put a 20, if you put a, just a single level or a two level there next to those two bigger ones, it's gonna look goofy. And then, um, you know, the hotel, um, you asked for 65, I mean, we could do 70 there. I, I mean, that's just, I, I'm just spitballing is, what I'm hearing is if, you, if we wanna make this financially viable, we need to do something with this, so. Why don't we just make it 65, that's yeah, what we want. Yeah, this is so bizarre. It, it's, it just, it's, it, you're, you're, you're saying, well, I, 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 want, yeah. I want $100, but you know what? I'm giving you 200. Yeah, right. <laughs> why, why don't we just give them 65? Yeah. Well, they're, because they're right at it. Well, then let's, t let's give it to them. And move on. He wants 65. I already understand the setback. I'm good with that. Let's move on. I know. Alderman I Shellpepper. I, I, yeah, I, I, I guess I got to say, so we're talking about, you know, we wanted master planning. So we master plan. But, but just at the beginning of this conversation, you said this was never part of the original plan. So, so there's not really, a, this isn't a master plan discussion. This is a new request discussion that's happening right now. No. It's part of a, it's called a plan development. 
So this is this is part of the. But you didn't plan own this home. parcel until just when? And that's why we're putting together a plan. Right. And so we. What's, it's what's, a, what's, it's, what's the question then? What, what's, 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 okay, so we're, we're master planning. We're asking for a rendering of the height to understand what that's going to look like. Isn't that a master plan? How does that go against a master plan? Why do you keep looking over to Alderman Caviezel? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to call Jason up. So, I mean, Jason's a planner. I mean, well, Jason, it's, Jason, is it pretty typical for a community to come in, you know, uh, three weeks ago, ask for a 65 foot building, and the community says, okay. Sounds good. It's been a month. Or does it usually take a little bit longer? What's a typical <laughs> timeline for something like this in a typical community? Oh, a planned development could take six months to get approved. Yeah, and so what are we, how, what are we, what's the timeline we're, we're probably working, working on, on right now? third month right okay, now. Okay, so we're doing pretty good. We're moving pretty fast. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand where Alderman Shellpepper is coming from. If he can't visualize it, um, there, this is one of the flexibility requests is the is the feel of this building. How is it going to look in that area? And if you, you want to request a rendering, <laughs> you know, that wouldn't be typical if it, it conformed to all zoning, but it doesn't. Exactly. So, uh, you know, I think you're under the right, you know, to have your opinion and ask for a rendering. If the other uh, council members can visualize it at 65 and feel that's, that's appropriate, you know, I gave you examples of other buildings that were, you know, upwards in that height, then, then you know, you vote how you feel. So I, I think it's, it's uh, I can understand why you're asking for that, a, a rendering of how it would look in that location, because that is the flexibility they're asking for. Well, can we make Alderman a motion? Alderman Ellis? Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, go back to uh, Alderman Schultz. He wasn't Schultz. finished, go ahead. I thought he was done. Well, no, I, my question is, can we, can we make an motion to amend and put it on the table, and if, you know, if it gets voted down, it gets yeah, voted you down. Yeah, can, you can do all those different options. I want to try to keep it in the open discussion yeah. first so everybody has a chance to speak. Alderman Ellis. So at, at the end of the day, it, this is only a first reading. So if we just go ahead and we allow it for the first reading and then bring it back, it gives us time to think through our questions instead of staying here until 1 a.m. in the morning. So I'm going to request that we approve or recommend to accept this project as is as first reading. Are you making a motion? I'm making a motion. Okay, there's a motion on the floor to approve the recommendation. Approve the recommendation. Um, is there a second? I think we need to make some more, well, I, I guess I can't talk until there's a second. Is there a motion to second? If there's no motion to second, then the motion fails. Okay. We'll go back to a discussion. Alderman Kavieski. I'd like some clarity, uh, Jason. Um, there, height is a big height is a big thing. Would you agree? Yeah, that's yeah. that's the yeah, that's the biggest I, concern, I'm still and that's for the due, due, valid. due diligence. That absolutely. So there's there's some some issue with how you kind of went through 15 feet, 12 feet, got the 63 and what that provides for, at, at least from what I'm hearing. And so if get to 60 feet um, with building, you can go another five feet with a trellis in height, but that's not really high enough to do a trellis. It's not structural building that gets you to 63 or 65. I think that's kind of where some of the the question is. Where does the building itself stop, or is the architectural element like a trellis at that 65 feet? Can you can you help kind of under? All right. Well, the that? the code says um, 50 feet right now, and architectural projections um, can go up another 10 feet. Um, that would be like an elevator shaft or something like that. So I, a trellis might fall under that, but if you guys set the height, you're already going above 50. If you set the height at 65, that, that, that would be it. 65 would be it for anything to, to be, you know, part of the building attached, you know. Um, and the example I, I ran the council through with the 15 foot on the ground floor and then 12 foot, that's 12 foot stories, um, you know, if, if you wanted something a little bit more than that for little taller ceiling height, 
we're, we're restricting them down because I got you right at 63, right. and you add even, you know, w one foot, you're at 67 for the four stories. So it, it, I just wanted the council to know that the, the 12 foot's just kind of a number out there. So with, without objection, I'd like to take a 10-minute break. We'll come back at uh, 9.45. Any objection? No. Okay, let's take a 10-minute break. Let's kind of resort where we're at. I want to make sure we make the right decision moving forward. Oh, that, Thank you. Does that mean, no, no, no. I, I want to just take well, I, more I don't time to look at you. Can no. I'm, not, I'm not trying to explain no, it. I'm just trying to make sure that it comes back with okay. the right thing. I'm so having way if, too much fun. If the building stops the here, right, the, the way actual structure, and they want to do a pergola. Doing this for 40 years. They been doing can't this for do a pergola that's above 65 feet. If we say the building stops at 65 feet and you get up to 10 feet more for architectural element and they want to do a pergola, they can do a pergola. I think we need to understand that visually and provide That's why, I direction. I just don't understand why we can't get this. He says it can take two months to get that? Are you kidding me? So I got to write the check. I think he's saying that because <laughs> the architect that they're using is also the architect that the Sendex is using and they don't it's have the capacity uh, to do this both at the same time and yeah. render. That, I oh, think that's I, what I, 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 I was saying. Oh, I know. Just for more information, I, and yep. so just make sure we're Doing the right showing thing. that we care and that we're yep. asking tough questions. And but then when you guys are like throwing out seventy-five and like trying to pitch these, for me, it, out, it's just I, like I, I, I'm not. So for me, when I said 70, yeah. it was to say the you building itself I mean, I stops at the 65, but you can do a trellis up to 70. Take a motion. So you can have that, that, that gathering space up on top of the roof. For what, that, that's where my mind was in there, not that you can go the building to 70. It, it, that's why I think we need some clarity in regards to what the building is and what's anything above that is. Or is the actual absolute top? What we're saying because right. as he said with Fall Lake Village, the building height is right, 62 X. or 65, but then there's the, the elevator shaft and everything else goes above that, so it's almost 70, what is it, 79 feet is at the, the top, top of any element at, at Fall Lake Village. So, 70 something, yeah. so I, I, I think that's what I want to give them absolute clarity on because if they come back with a rendering, yes, and the understanding that they leave with is the anything can't be higher than 65 or the building needs to be 65 you can do a trellis on top or whatever architectural i want them to understand that because i want to understand that that's a good point yeah, yeah that's all like, that's all i'm not trying to jam anything oh, no, through wait a you're being a psychologist short that out i just want to make sure they understand <laughs> exactly where <laughs> the doing those are for what <laughs> but you know yeah. that makes sense um there's there are some things I, you know, I wish I had yeah, the I don't opportunity know. to I don't know how I, I feel on it because I, I just I don't, don't know what it looks like. Okay. And I, um, oh, yeah. I'm talking about.
Uh, okay, well, thank you for the lively discussion. We're back in session. Um, I want to continue with any open comments from the um, aldermen for either Mr. Maroney or Mr. Gawa. Do we have any further comments? Okay, so, oh. It doesn't matter, yeah, whoever wants go to ahead. know. No, go ahead, whoever. Alderman Kavieski. So just a uh, point of order, because I, I saw Alderman Shellpepper, if, if he can go first, and then not me, then. Oh, Alderman sure, I'm, I, did, I saw yours yeah. first, but yeah. Well, Alderman I'm Shellpepper. not planning on engaging in discussion or comment, I was gonna make a motion. So if you oh. anticipated to ask more questions or comment, yeah. then yeah. Oh, okay, so during, during break, um, we had some conversation I want to make sure that there's clarity in regards to the height. And we had conversation that there was specific uh, height caps, and then th there were building heights that elements could go above. Is that, and I want to make sure that we give um, Wangard clear direction if it's 65 feet, nothing above 65 feet, or if it's 65 feet, they could do a trellis or whatever. Whatever that is, I want to make sure that height is clearly identified for whatever caps and maximums. Right. There are. This is a, a plan development, and not only do you want to give, I, I want clear direction because they're going to ask me as soon as uh, tomorrow rolls around, how high can we go? You know, right. It, what what <laughs> is 65? Can we put an elevator shaft above that? I, w I want to know where the council stands on this. So, um, you know, if you guys say 65 feet is the maximum height. That's the maximum height, you know, uh, of, of anything attached to that building, you know. Um, under your code, the definition of how you measure height is from the uh, lowest level that is uh, at um, ground. the ground level to the highest point of a building. So if you say 65 feet, that's how it will be determined by your code. So for clarification then, if we say 65 feet, and there is an elevator shaft associated with that, they're probably going to get less than 60 feet of actual building because the elevator shaft is going to potentially go above that. Is that Right. Correct? Our code does have a height exemption area that talks about 10 additional feet for um, apparatuses and things like that. So if, if the council said 65 would be to the top of the building with uh, various accessory things going up 10 additional feet like stairways and uh, elevator shafts, you know, that would give them the 65 feet of building plus that. So that's something you could take under consideration. Alderman Rose. So here, here's what I think based on that. That, that was a really good question. I, I don't know why we're actually struggling with this. Um, I go to places all around the country, new developments like this. I was just in, um, I think it was Darby, Ohio. And it was in the middle of a residential area on the edge of the river. They, they tore everything down just like this project. And they put like eight, nine story hotels. And I mean, it is one of the coolest spots. Um, it's all new restaurants, the whole nine yards. I mean, I, I think we should be trying to help the developer at this point do a good job, make it look nice, um, but also maximize the TIF and get the TIF paid off because we're in the hook in the hawk for $11 million. So here's my proposal. I, these, the whole four buildings here, the three pink ones that are on the sheet and the one, we amend this slightly from their request. We give them 65 feet of, 65 feet of height for all four buildings with an additional 10 feet for any architectural elements above that. So a gazebo, a patio, They've got a little oh, design yeah. element like the Marriott has where it's got like a weird little triangle thing in the corner or whatever. That gives them the flexibility to do what they need to do and not be right at that, you know, we're at 63 and a half feet and we can't go any higher and if there's a little thing sticking out, we're, we're screwed. I think that gives them the flexibility they need. I think it makes sense and I think it's sellable. The other thing we need to have at least one step back in the structure. So at the very top, Buildable level, so the fourth level or the fifth level needs to be stepped back. At least, I think, at least five feet, and per, you know, that would, could be open for discussion. It, then what we're looking at is a building that looks very similar to Fowler Lake Village. Yep. Fowler Lake Village is liked by the community. It brought in a high-end level of folks buying very expensive condominiums, retail on the first floor, step backs, even though at the very, very middle and the top, it's like 75 feet, 
it doesn't look like 75 feet. Right. And I, that's a building I can sell to my constituents. It's my district, and I think they'll like it. And if we've got three or four of them lined up there, and there's restaurants, and there's parking, and there's you know your new medical building right there, and a, and a nice hotel to take mom and dad to when they come in town, I think it's a, I think it's doable, and that's what I would propose. I'll make the motion once we have more dis discussion. I'll wait for the discussion. Alderman Kavieski. So I, I I'd also I'm I'm on board with that. Um, I would like to have the discussion about where we could um, get that rendering based on it going through plan commission. If you could help me with that. Well, the question was asked: Can the council ask? for those th things, and the answer is yes. Can you require it as part of the PD? I believe you can. It's part of the flexibility that you can ask for. Here's what I, I propose that we only do the first reading. We do not waive the second reading. They come back by next week or the next meeting with some renderings that give us an idea of it, gives us a chance to talk to our constituents. I think we can sell it. The, and I, the, so just if you were looking at that, not, um, they're Mr. Moroni, <laughs> is that, <laughs> If we there's a hypothetical <laughs> no you, that goes forward. Can you create renderings within no. for our next council meeting? No, okay. to have the quality that you want to have and to have it make sure that it works in the marketplace. Because the moment I show that rendering, that's that's what it is, right? I have no confidence that in two weeks I have a market study. I know exactly what we're doing. It's going to work for for everybody involved and have a, have a pretty picture that that that's what we're going to build. It's, it's not realistic. I'm just being honest. Yeah. No, no, that's, that's fair. I think people need to understand that. Alderman uh, Kavieski. We can require, so uh, Alderman Ellis, to, to your, to your um, attempt to, to, to move this forward, that there's going to be some amendments to this and then a, a, a vote. So it's not going to be, I, I don't think it's going to be brought forth as it is right now for a vote. That's why um, there's a difference in approach to what we're doing right now. The rendering um, can be approved once its uh, use has been determined and it can appropriately be uh, designed for this body to approve as it goes through plan and then come here, is that correct? <coughs> if, if we made the motion that way, that way because I, I get it, I was in design build. If you put a rendering in front of us or the community, that is what it's going to be, period. Or it's going to be a, a fight, and then it's going to any variance from that is going to pigeonhole this thing, and that's not going to maybe be in the best interest of utilization. But to the concern of the council and the community, we want to see what that visually looks like ultimately before it's approved. Alderman Rozak. So I'd like to make a motion well, then to amend the. Um, a second, Alderman Sh or, uh, Alderman Shellpepper. Well, I, I had mentioned earlier I wanted to make a motion, and okay. when the comments were were done being oh. made, I wanted to put forward a motion. Go ahead. Go ahead. Could, could I do that? And, and we'll we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm going to make a motion to approve all the exemptions except the building height requirements contingent on the applicant returning within. Name your name your your time frame. Is it one month? Can you do it in one month? Two months. Is that what you said then? Stay up there, Matt. <laughs> Stay up here. <laughs> uh, I wish I could give you a specific time time frame, Alderman. Okay. Um, I mean, I will try. To, we'll try to do something as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I hear your concern, and I uh, appreciate it. To be honest with you, and I think you have the flexibility that before we would start construction, if the council wanted to see and formally approve those buildings before we start construction. Correct me if I'm wrong, Stan. I think. If you agree it's, to it, yeah. I mean, right. I, I, it, it, this has been a partnership all along. We're not trying to jam anything through or anything. I, I, I hope you're not getting that impression. And, you know, our plan would be, once we'd have it designed, we would actually seek all of your feedback, much like we have throughout this entire project. So I don't have a problem once we have done a market study and design it and come back in. But just kind of tell us generally what the rules of the game are so that we, we can know what we're striving for. Well, well, that's so a, that's kind of what we're asking right. for. So I'm, I'm comfortable coming back 
and having you guys approve those buildings. I'm comfortable because, like I said, I don't want to jam anything down any community's throats. We're partners, and that's how, that's how we approach things. So, so I just don't want to give you the wrong impression because I think you're getting the wrong impression. I'm like going, going, no, going. No, no, no. And, and I just want to know what the rules of the game are and then design well, the building, and then if you want to approve those, well, no problem. Uh, and I, I, okay, so two months, okay, is, is that, is that, that's what I'm understanding then, two months that you... I, I don't know, I, I can't... Okay. okay, so... <laughs> well, that's if you what really we want to get as, my, so my motion would be to approve all the exemptions except the building height requirements. The applicant would return in two months with a rendering of 65 feet as the baseline with an additional 10 feet for, you know, auxiliary, or what, what um... Architectural, you know, structures on the top that would allow up to a, a 75 foot maximum. Um, so how does that sound, Stan? Does that make sense? Well, what I just said. The problem is he doesn't know who the end user is. So, so I, I think that's a great motion in a lot of ways, to be honest with you. And I think if you want to say, hey, before you start construction or get a permit, we want to see it and approve it. I don't have a problem with that. Oh, so you don't even have to have a end time on it. Yeah, before, that's what I'm saying. Before final approval of the height. They must produce plans that are acceptable to the to, to the, the council. council. I, I think I think we go with what I want to do, Chaz, which is 65 for all four, with the 10 foot accessory, with the step back, and then with with the caveat that before the buildings are are finalized or or whatever, that they come back to council for approval of the buildings. That gives us our chance to look at the renderings and say. But mm. but, but at that point, we've already legally allowed that. We have said then that you are allowed to have the 65 foot minimum. End of story. And I, I'm not there yet because I haven't seen what we're actually dealing. with But if with they come yet. back and we don't like the, if we if we write it into the, into this motion, they, they have to come back. And if we don't like the look or we think it's too tall, we just say, eh, do something different. You know, step that step that back a little bit more or whatever. I mean, I I think that gives us the control we want. Stan. Well, the problem that you got is if you do approve a PUD that allows for that height, then you get into a, uh, an argument as to whether or not you're being reasonable in terms of the aesthetics down the line. Um, if you don't want to approve the height, don't approve it. If you want to approve the height under this PUD, approve it. If you, want, if you don't approve it, they can always come back and ask for an amendment to their PUD uh, at that point in time when they build it. Um, we're, we're fighting over 10 feet or 15 feet of height. Um, why don't you fo folks decide what you want to do? So we have the start of a motion, and I want to make sure where we are that we complete yeah, it or I'm, withdraw I'm gonna it. Yeah, I'm going to just stick with it, and we'll, it. we'll see what happens. Um, I, I, no, I'm not going to rephrase it because okay. I, I understand what Alderman Rose is saying, but I, I still think then we're basically signing off on the 65 foot. Right. foot. I, I don't, I'm not opposed to the 65 foot. I'm just trying to give our community <coughs> as much time as possible to assess what we're going to be put in there. And that's, I think that's, that's all I'm trying to do. I think that's very fair, yeah, and so. I think everybody's trying to work together. The positive thing is we have a developer that wants to work with us yeah. as much as we want to make sure we get what we've been asking for. So I think that's very, very fair. I, but I think we need to move this forward. We've been talking about it and going in circles. Yeah. And so I think you put the motion. Would you restate it? I want so, to make sure that everybody, we hear it correctly, we have it set up properly before somebody offers to make a motion or a yeah, second. Yep, so I'm, I'm going to move to a, approve all the exemptions except the building height requirement contingent on the applicant returning in two months with the rendering um, based on a 65-foot primary structure with architectural designs allowed to go another 10 feet. Do you, do you want to see the step backs in there? Um, if he wants to see the render of the motion. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to just... Okay. Do we have a motion on the floor? Or do I have a second? The motion then fails. Do I have another motion? I've, I've been there, Chaz. Yeah. Be, be, <laughs> I make a lot of hey, motions. You guys are going to be getting it Before on the other you make end. that motion, I'd like to see the safety elements inc incorporated into the zero setback along the patio. Some safety elements. elements. Well, I'm, I'm going I'm to I'm gonna move to amend the one section regarding the height. You can do that if you want to. I, I don't think we need it. I think we should trust the developer on that. I don't know. I don't think having a patio near a bicycle lane is a safety issue. The bicycle lane is on 67. Yeah, but the patios are on the other side. Let, I mean, I, I just I just think we need to give them some flexibility on that. 
And look, I mean, I, you know, I was, yeah, so I, I, I don't care if you want to make that motion, but I want to do this one separately so it's very clear. I'm going to move to approve, well, do you want to make the safety things or not? Please do them separately. Let's, let, let, let me just amend. We'll vote for one let, and not the other. Let me move other, so. to amend this part of the request, okay? Mm -hmm. And then if anyone yep. else wants to make yep. an amendment, I think it makes yep. the most I'm sense. I'm on board with that. I want all four of those buildings to be uh, 65 feet in height with 10 feet of architectural elements at the top with at least one step back of no less than five feet with finding, final building approval to be done by council. Second. One question, you want final building design what the design and what it looks like by council, correct? Yeah, like a general design. I mean, general design. Yeah, I just like want to make sure design I know approval what you by want. council. Okay. Like, I don't want to look at each little brick in the windows panes, okay. right? Just That's kind right. of a general conceptual design of the buildings. Okay. So we have a motion. Did I hear a second? Second, Ellis. A second was Ellis. Any further discussion? This is just to amend the plan before right. without voting on the whole plan. Mm -hmm. Call roll, please. Alderman Mulder. Aye. Alderman Shellpepper? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Douglas? Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Zaffel? Alderman Ellis? Aye. So the amendment is made, and I'm looking for a motion. I'd like to make an amendment to that for consideration that the safety elements be incorporated into the zero setback uh, by the patio. Um, this area. Yeah. I, I, I think. I want to give you flexibility in regards to what those safety elements are. Could be fence, could be ballard. Um, That's good. It'll run through architectural and planning. Sure. And that'll provide a, a, a buffer between that bike path, which is on 67, which is a main artery into the downtown, which is a little bit different than the downtown. So for the safety of the community that's going to be using that and the visitors, I'm making that amendment request. Do we have a second? Did I hear what I'm sorry? Douglas, Douglas a second. Any further discussion? Call roll, please. Alderman Mulder? Nay. Oh. Alderman Shellpepper? Nay. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Douglas? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Hmm. Nay. Alderman Zaffel? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Nay. Uh, one, two, three, failed. four. Failed. I mean, the no's. The amendment, the amendment right. did the not amendment pass. The amendment failed. The no's had four no's, three yeses. Are there any further um, <coughs> amendments uh, to this proposal? To this ordinance change, I should say. Then I would entertain a motion for the ordinance. So moved. Second, Second. Ellis. Any, and we're maintaining it as a first reading, correct? For clarity? Correct. Correct, correct. Any further discussion? Call roll, please. Alderman Mulder. Aye. Yeah, Alderman Shellpepper. Nay. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Douglas. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Zaffel. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Okay, motion passed. Thank you all. Let's move on. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of good discussion. Good Thank discussion. you. On a new business, consider act on resolution 22-R3001, accepting the petition for direct annexation for the Robert Miller lands located on County Trunk K. <clears throat> Mr. Gallo. Thank you. It's been so long, I think the computer fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a petition, a resolution in your packet for the direct annexation of land from the town of Oconomowoc into the city. Uh, there's two pieces. Uh, they're two separate pieces with two separate tax key numbers, but all the land is vacant. They're located on the south corner here of <coughs> Highway K and uh, Highway P. It's under the same ownership. Um, you can see right there uh, the size is, and it's about 40 uh, acres or, or a little more than that in size. The total area is actually um, 
two, two acres. I think this larger one is about 36 and this is about six acres roughly. Um, for the master plan for this area, we did create the planning department along with the applicants a uh, little neighborhood plan. This is a concept plan. It's not been approved by the council. You haven't seen it, but we've we started being a little more aggressive planning out this northeast area. The areas that we're talking about annexing tonight would be the uh, future commercial right on the corner of P and Z. It's the same depth of commercial as we have for Piggly Wiggly and the stuff north of that, and then a transitional area, and that other smaller piece that's five or six acres is right in this area, and that would be residential. So we have future land uses. I did contact all the other owners um, that are south of K to ask if they wanted to join in on this annexation. That'd be uh, Mr. Rosenau um, and, and uh, the other gentleman uh, here, and uh, th they were not interested in doing that at this time, but I did offer that up thinking that it could all come in at the same time, but there's two owners left in the town that's south of, of Highway K. Do we have any questions for Mr. Gallo? Hey, it was... Yeah, I do, Mr. Rosen. Wasn't Miller the guy we bought all the land from for the park? Yes. Yep. Is it 57,000 an acre, 51,000 an acre, 47,000 That's an the acre. land coming in tonight is okay. Mr. Miller's land. That's the yeah. rest of his land, okay. Mm -hmm. I'd like to entertain a motion. So move, Kavieski. <laughs> Second, Ellis. <laughs> Any further discussion? <clears throat> Roll, please. Alderman Mulder. Aye. Alderman Shellpepper. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Douglas. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Zappel? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. And to consider Act Resolution 22-R3006, <coughs> approving support of the WEDC <coughs> Idle Sites Grant Submission for the Olympia Fields Redevelopment Project. Mr. Duffy. As part of our tax incremental agreement with Wangard Partners, um, we have agreed as partners to, to collaborate uh, when funding opportunities become available. As you heard from Mr. Maroney earlier, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation is asking for additional improvements in Highway 67 uh, based on the future growth that they anticipate of this area, not just within Olympia Fields, but likely to the west. Um, one of the programs that is available is idle sites. Idle sites grants are available for pieces of real estate or lands that have been vacant or idle for more than, or for five years or more, of which this qualifies. So. Basically, the resolution we're asking to approve is authorizing us to submit a grant in the amount of $250,000, which would be matched, $250,000, which would come from the TIF district to help with these improvements. Any questions for Mr. Duffy? Mr. Shell Whose Alderman fault Shell is it? How come we're spending 500 grand that we weren't planning on? Whose fault is it? I don't believe it's anybody's fault. The Department of Transportation looks at these improvements and what could happen to the west and, and added them, not only here, but also to different intersections to the north. How come we can't anticipate that? I mean, how, how is it that we don't know what, what statutory obligations we have on intersections? You know, the so reason we don't have a tunnel under 67. Exactly. That's the exact issue. That's and the that's problem. And that's because your friends over in Madison are not trustworthy. Mr. Fry. So when we go into a project and, and work on the designs, the preliminary designs based on things that uh, we're, we're making assumptions, you know, from other projects that we've seen. On this development, for some reason, the DOT decided to look further and further out than just what we needed for the traffic coming into this development. And because of that, it increased the number of cars, and so then they looked at changing the length of the uh, the turn lanes for stacking, and then that's what created all this extra expense. So we went in with a standard design of what we felt would work for this through our engineers, and then the DOT came back and said, oh no, they're looking at Paps Farms, they're looking at all this other area that's way down, and they're saying you've gotta accommodate all of that. So that's where this came from. I'll just say, I, I you know, and, and I'm not a professional in the area, but this is the kind of thing where, like, why I ask questions and try to do the due diligence on the front end, because we end up with $500,000 bills that we have to pay now, and I gotta listen to Alderman Rosick say we have to have five extra stories to pay it off. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> we should have had this on, the, uh, on the front end, so. Skyscrapers, <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Duffy? Your frustration, Alderman Shellpepper, I think is shared by 
everyone sitting here, including the developer. Yes. And uh, they're all good. That's great questions. I'm glad you brought it up. Any other questions on this for Mr. Duffy? I'd like to entertain a motion. So, so move, move Ellis. Second, Taviasby. <coughs> Any further discussion? Call roll, please. Alderman Mulder. Aye. Alderman Shellpepper. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Douglas. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Zappel. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Consider act on resolution 22-R3008, acceptance of destination marketing grant. Mr. Duffy. After our conversation on December 21st, I re, uh, reached out to the department administration because there was some conversation about um, could we use this for, for these funds for a different purpose? Um, they got back to me, um, although only uh, not too long ago. So I shared that email with you. Um, we would need to have a resolution or direction for staff to be able to sign the agreement. That's what the resolution is indicating. Um, right now, we're still investigating what we could use the money for. What we do know is we need to use it for destination marketing programs um, and tourism promotion. Um, we will continue to look at what those are. Happy to bring those. You know what I what I said in the in the documents is we do have a destination marketing plan we'll look at. Um, but what I do need is authorization to sign the agreement so we have access to the money. I'm happy to bring back ideas and concepts that we come through. Uh, some of the things we've thought about is some form of video promotion for the community. Um, it's been 10 years since John McGivern's been here. Okay. Discovery Wisconsin hasn't been here in 40 years. Um, so we have different things we can possibly use the money for, uh, but I first need the authorization to sign the agreement, then we have access to the money. So what you're proposing is signing the agreement gives us access to money, but you are gonna come back with options. Correct. And then council will make those decisions based on those options. Correct. Any uh, further comments or questions for Mr. Duffy? Alderman Rosak. No other money from the city right now on this deal, right? This is just the 47 grant correct. from the correct. state. Yep. Um, I thought in your memo you said that any final decision was gonna be made by the tourism committee, not us, but. Happy to bring it back to you. Yeah, as long as I you're said okay. work with the tourism commission. Okay, on the thing, but I, I don't, this is gonna shock you, Bob. Uh oh. I don't really need to see it again. I thought the money, the signage tucked in the corner was a complete waste of money, and I thought it was a bad idea. But if the other things you've mentioned to me on this in the before and whatever, you got a tourism committee to decide that, I don't necessarily need to see it again. At this point, we're not spending any more city money and taxpayer money, and if we get it from the state and it can help promote the city and you've got a good idea, you know, just don't, don't put a billboard hidden behind trees and I think I'll be okay with it. <laughs> that was so, a rendering. Yeah, I know. Place. I told you, I was going to surprise you. We hadn't located the sign yet yeah, yeah, back yeah, there. Yeah. But Caps Farms. <laughs> <laughs> to entertain a motion, please. Kavieski. Rosick second. Any further discussion? Call roll, please. Alderman Mulder. Aye. Alderman Shellpepper. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Douglas. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Zappel. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. With uh, no staff reports, are there any reports or comments from Alderman? Alderman Zappel. Just want to wish a happy 50th birthday to my brother Don in Aurora, Colorado. Hope you're watching. <laughs> Hope you're not. <laughs> Do you like your brother? <laughs> Does he get his ARP card at the age of 50 or not? I was just wondering. No, 55. Uh, okay. Any other comments, folks? But no more comments. There are no comments from the mayor. I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. Fieski. Second. Mulder. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. I made sure that we had.